Today we face many global challenges. Climate change, pollution, malnutrition, infectious diseases and resistance to antibiotics, to name a few. They are already having a significant impact on our health, planet and society. Our food system is central to all these challenges. We must act now. How can we take food safety science to the next level and play our part in finding solutions? How should we work together to build a better, more sustainable future? This conference tackles these critical questions and more. This is a unique opportunity to share the latest insights, to make new connections and explore solutions together. The current model of industrial agriculture isn't sustainable. It's a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. It's wiping out biodiversity and it's damaging soils. If we lose insect pollinators, then a, a substantial chunk of our food production would disappear. We wouldn't have most of the fruits and vegetables that we'd rely on for healthy diets. The pandemic has changed our lives. It has changed our relations and it has changed the way we perceive our health. The younger generation is the one that is going to inherit this planet based on the actions of the past and the present, and they need to be actively involved and have a voice. I think the one conference should help us to better understand the complex interlinkages around the food system, to identify joint research priorities and the synergies we can develop between our organizations. Digital research methods and tools are helping us to reach people at a scale and a pace which was previously impossible. So examples of these are going to be presented in the conference and they're really quite exciting. We can reach the hearts and minds of people by shaping powerful messages that resonate with people and empower action. The more scientists understand who will use the science that they produce and what it means, the better the chance that they will focus the investments in science on those matters. The benefits of cooperation between the, the different agencies and the stakeholders are clear because we are facing common challenges. One Health needs to grow, needs to encompass more disciplines and become a truly transdisciplinary space. One Health is about making the connection between human, animal health and the environment. And we can do much more for One Health if we think and work together. So let's take this opportunity to share our knowledge and expertise. Let's make connections and let's work together for new solutions. Before we begin, please give a warm welcome on stage to EFSA's Executive Director, Bernhard Earl. Good afternoon and welcome. I was looking here for the unmute button, but we don't need it here. It's good to see all of you here physically in person, so thank you very much for having joined our conference and welcome to the One Health, Environment and Society Conference of 2022. To all of you attending here, physically in Brussels, but also to those who are joining us remotely. This is our fourth scientific conference. EFSA has organized four conferences over the last 10 years. The first one was held in 2012 in Parma to mark our 10th anniversary. The second one at the World Expo in Milano in 2015, and the third edition again in Parma in 2018. And as this week's conference is taking place in 2022, it offers us an opportunity to look back at the first two decades of our work. And I think we can say all together that impressive food safety progress has been achieved in Europe over the last 20 years due to the joint efforts of farmers, food industry, retailers, civil society representatives, consumers, national food safety authorities, 
and the European institutions. And EFSA, founded by means of, I would say, a landmark general food law in 2002, has played an important role in this success story. By connecting data and mobilizing expertise from across the European Union, and by providing scientific advice from farm to fork. And let me please express at this point a big thank you to our member state partners for their contributions and their commitment. EFSA would not have been successful without your support. Thank you very much for that. This year's edition of our conference is special for two reasons. First, it marks our 20th anniversary. Second, for the first time, the conference was organized by EFSA together with our so-called sister ENVI agencies, the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, the European Chemicals Agency, the European Environment Agency, the European Medicines Agency, and the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Jointly, we brought together top scientists and distinguished experts from all over the world that will cover a wide array of scientific disciplines. And may I say personally, it's really a rewarding experience to see and feel you here in person after more than two years of virtual meetings. Well, although almost nothing seems to be normal in Europe in these days, I'm still sensing steps towards some sort of normality. And it comes, it comes with, with our desire to meet, to debate ideas with an energy which I think that only can come from human encounters. So, why are we here? You know that EFSA's core task is to deliver scientific advice to the risk managers at European and national levels. And over the years, the environment of our work has drastically changed. So, ensuring independence of our advice, making data and methods transparent, engaging increasingly with our stakeholders, while delivering fit-for-purpose scientific advice, this has framed our work in the first 20 years. And mirroring these changes, our past conferences, they evolved from a focus on science to a broader view on the interplay between science, food, and society. And with this edition of the conference, we want to go even a step further. Because looking at the world of today, we see a confluence of crisis, the war, the climate change, pandemics, migration, of disruptions, supply chains, societal expectations, energy prices, inflation, and innovations. And the speed of change is really frightening. It is creating unprecedented levels of complexity. And as this complexity is felt by us citizens directly, it also creates widespread uncertainty and anxiety. And the food system in itself is in a state of crisis. Hunger, obesity, food waste, resource depletion, biodiversity losses. It is a well-established fact that the global food production system already today operates outside the planetary boundaries with a trajectory of further deterioration. Many studies have pointed that out. And personally, uh, a publication of the World Resource Institute a few years ago struck me deeply because it was so pertinent and clear and it added the notion of urgency to complexity and uncertainty. And the authors have extrapolated the current food practices to the year of 2050, when, as we all know, approximately 10 billion people will inhabit the planet. And they pointed out three massive gaps. A calorie gap, so we will have to produce more than 50% more calories to nurture the 10 billion people. A land use gap, we will not have the agricultural land to produce these calories, and a greenhouse gas reduction gap. The authors also proposed a set of more than 20 actions for closing these gaps. In short, 
it is achievable, but it requires a fundamental systemic transformation of the global food system. My colleagues and I at EFSA strongly be believe and feel that we can support such a transformation, but it will require joint actions. And with this week's conference, we therefore, we would like to explore how food safety and more integrated health assessments can contribute to the transformation of food systems. And here, the One Health concept comes into play. One Health is an integrated, unifying approach. It aims at balancing and Im optimizing, improving the health of humans, animals, and the environment. It's today a well-established and globally applied concept. And to support the cooperation between governments, United Nations agencies and intergovernmental organizations have created the One Health High Level Expert Panel in 2020. And at the European level, the European Commission, as well as the French Presidency of the European Council, they have made the One Health approach central to their health policy initiatives. So, the aim of our conference, conference is to zoom into the foundations of One Health, of the concept which consists of a systemic view on health, transdisciplinary integration, and collaboration and coordination. So it's not a disruptive innovation. We knew this for decades. The One Health concept basically is reminding us that we should not slice down health into too many scientific disciplines that work in silos and in too many administra administrative streams that do not collaborate. We think that the principles of One, One Health make it ideal to support our work on addressing the complexity and the urgency of the health challenges ahead. At EFSA, we feel it makes it ideal to support our work on addressing the future challenges. And we think that by applying these features, our food safety work will advance, it will be more fit for purpose, but beyond this, the delivery of a, of a more integrated, cross-sectoral and collaborative health assessment will also better inform policies which aim to transform the food systems. So, in our view, the One Health concept can act as a stepping stone. It connects food safety to sustainable food systems. It also means, in my view, that planetary health will be firmly anchored within the One Health paradigm. So for the scientific EU agencies, One Health can serve as a sort of a, a rallying point for coordination, collaboration and integration. And why is this important? From my perspective, there is a growing necessity for making sense, for sense-making out of the abundance of signals, data and knowledge. Scientific research is digging deeper and deeper on ever smaller pieces of what we could call the puzzle of understanding. Ever smaller breaks of evidence are discovered at exponential speed, but without necessarily integrating them into the wider picture of societal needs. And I dare to state here the hypothesis that we, the scientific EU agencies, we do a decent job in selecting, assessing, integrating evidence in our respective fields. But where we should get better, and this conference is an expression of this desire, is the art of integration. To combine our knowledge for more practical and therefore more impactful policy advice. Seeing us confronted with complexity, with uncertainty, with urgency, I believe we, the EU agencies collectively can provide more value-adding science to the EU policymakers. But this requires a transition, a transition towards integrated, cross-sectoral, collaborative ways of working for safety and health assessments. And for this very reason, we at EFSA, we are very strong supporters and indeed also practitioners of seamless collaboration. 
we want to design our scientific advice in a way that it can be used as a commodity, a connectable knowledge commodity, if you will. It should be ready to be used by our partners and it should be ready to be integrated in wider scenarios of agri-food sustainability assessments. So, having said this, what can you expect at this conference? My colleagues who have worked for almost two years in, in creating this conference, they have cut through the complexities with a keen and logical approach. I think they have designed an impressive four-day program, which aims in part to reflect on some of the points I have just made. So you will find embedded between the opening and closing plenary parallel breakout sessions organized along four thematic axes. One society covering engagement, communication, research and policy, open science, for example. One life zooming into specific human health impacts. One planet considering environmental health and sustainability and many ways addressing scientific principles and methods. And within these sessions, you might encounter topics one would not immediately expect at a conference centered around safe food, such, such as the future of social sciences in risk analysis, the increasing understanding of the importance of the human microbiome, or the transition towards systems-based environmental risk assessment. Finally, on a personal note, what do I wish you for this conference. I wish you inspiration coming from the speakers, the discussions, the breaks, the encounters. I wish you unplanned, fortunate discoveries. They often happen when we transcend our traditional realms of scientific disciplines and move to the frontiers, to the fault lines of our science. We pause there and we listen to the signals from the Black Sea of serendipity. Unplanned, fortunate discoveries. discoveries. And most heartfully, I wish you rewarding human encounters. These exchanges between us humans, based on curiosity and respect, they lay the groundwork for trust. And it is trust that can catalyze collaboration, can entice us to explore and take risks together, can make us become partners. And I think this is exactly what we need for the huge transformational tasks in front of us. Long-term, trustful partnerships based on common objectives and shared values. Dear colleagues, in the words, of the US writer Lawrence Block. Let us allow serendipity. And in the coming days, maybe we will start looking for something. We will find something else. And then we will realize that what we have found is more suited to our needs than what we thought we were looking for. I wish you an exciting experience and good days together. Thank you very much. And now, I have the pleasure and the honor to welcome on stage Madame Commissioner Stella Kyriakides. As Commissioner in charge of Health and Food Safety since December 2019, from the very beginning of her tenure, her resilience was truly tested with the coordination of the EU's response to the COVID crisis. She and her team were also and are still leading the development of the European Commission's Farm to Fork strategy, the EU's blueprint for a transition towards a fair, healthy and sustainable food system. Hence, I think there's no one who could be better placed to open our conference than Commissioner Kyriakides. Madam Commissioner, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for giving us the honor. Good afternoon, everyone. Bernard, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. 
It really is a great pleasure to be here. And Bernard started his, um, his speech today by saying how wonderful it is to be here in person. And I had exactly the same feeling when I walked into this auditorium after such a long time of working online. We have all done, I think, important work online, all of you. We have managed to see how we can use uh, technology to uh, continue with our daily work and our daily lives. But ultimately, all being here together, I think, is what makes a difference. And I think being together at such a conference, it's not um, only about what you'll be discussing in plenaries, but it's what you'll be discussing on the sides in coffee breaks when you're networking. And that's what we come away from, from conferences. So uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm, it's a great pleasure. And thank you for the honor of being invited to be here today. Well, we've come together today to explore how we can make food uh, and feed safety more sustainable and how we can carry our future goals forward and how through initiatives like the European Green Deal, we are able to deliver what I would say is a collaborative response and one that protects our health, our planet and of course our society. And these are all very important issues for our time. I therefore want to take this opportunity to thank EFSA for making them the focus of the next four days and for giving me the honor of opening the conference today. And also I want to thank EFSA for really giving us, uh, myself and all of my team, the scientific foundation that we have been able to base a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last two and a half years. And it's very important to have uh, an agency that you, that you know gives you uh, sound science and that really strengthens your voice in the work that you do, so thank you. But I want to take this opportunity to thank EFSA's sister agencies as well. ECDC, the European Centre of Disease Prevention and Control, the European, Medicines, um, the European Chemicals Agency, the European Medicines Agency and the European Environment Agency. Because together with the Commission's Joint Research Centre, they are all co-organizing today's event. And this shows how much we must use One Health in all our work, and we, we need to use it horizontally, and as has been said, not work in silos. The COVID-19 pandemic, and of course more recently Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, has highlighted how we need a robust and resilient food system, and how we need to ensure that we are able to supply uh, affordable, safe food at all times. It's also brought home to each and every one of us how our health, our ecosystems, our supply chains, our consumption patterns, and planetary boundaries are interlinked. And the increasing recurrence that we have seen of droughts, of floods, of forest fires, of new pests, are a constant reminder that our food system is under threat and must become more sustainable and more resilient. And food safety and trust in the EU food safety system underpin more sustainable food systems. Ladies and gentlemen, we've also come together uh, to celebrate a significant milestone, the 20 year anniversary of the general food law regulation and the creation of EFSA. And the regulation's uh, impact cannot be understated its common definitions, its aims and general principles have redefined, and I would say they have even reshaped EU food law and policy. And chief among them is the risk analysis principle under which food law must be science-based. EFSA has cemented, as I have said, this science-based approach to policy making. And its scientific excellence has served to give the EU measures a solid scientific basis. And more, about, more on that, I would say that we need, and the word was used earlier by Bernard, the word of trust, because we need to have this. And it, uh, EFSA has enabled us to have maintained confidence in the EU food supply. Um, it has raised the EU food safety and standards, and it has helped raise international standards in the process because we cannot look at this alone. EFSA has also boosted both cooperation with national and international scientific bodies and information exchange with member states uh, and the Commission. 
the result. The result has been a mutual understanding of food-related risks, minimal risk of duplication, and fewer scientific divergences with other risk assessment bodies. And thanks to EFSA and the general food law, the European Union, I believe, can really pride itself by having one of the most robust and efficient food safety systems in the world. Our citizens have rightly called for continued improvements on how we assess risk, however. And we have listened to the European Citizens Initiative and responded with our new transparency regulation designed to increase trust in science and EU policy making. But our transformative journey is not over yet. And this is a journey that is going to be facing many challenges. And we also need to be aware of them and be able to deal with them. And we're now facing a new challenge in restoring our planet's fragile health. So we must do much more to keep ourselves and our planet safely. And our citizens clearly understand this. And that's why in the Conference for the Future of Europe, which many of you may have followed, we saw them express their concerns on climate change, on the environment. We saw them actually demand a more resilient, a healthier, environmentally friend friendly approach to food systems. And we are listening. The European Union is working precisely on that through the European Green Deal, the Farm to Fork strategy, and the proposed legislative framework for sustainable food systems. Our effort to become truly sustainable requires a paradigm shift and urgent action for all sectors and actors. But we are able to do this paradigm shift and we have seen this paradigm shift in the era of health because of COVID-19. If I may just dig digress for one second, because two and a half years ago, the, uh, the, um, the, the vision that we're talking about the European Health Union would have been something that we were not able to even think about. But there is a paradigm shift in the area of health. And we've, we've now know that we cannot look at health within our own boundaries. And with cross-border health threats, uh, we need to be able to work together. So we're able to do these paradigm shifts. And we need to all work together with all sectors and all actors on board. But we need to also continue to rely on very robust purpose, fit for purpose scientific evidence on food safety. We need to address the broader and complex challenges our society and planet face. And in this way, all together, because we need to be able to work together, we can strengthen European food systems and give it much stronger foundations. And really, our responsibility to deliver successful and robust policies for health, for the environment, and for society. I'm very pleased that we are um, going to be pursuing this journey together. I'm sure that over the next four days, you will have many opportunities to discuss this and uh, to really put, all, put forward the ideas that we all need in order to be able to take this journey to its end in a successful way and um, possibly make this future path even clearer. So once again, Thank you. Thank you, Bernard, for the invitation. Thank you for your attention. And I wish you the very best deliberations over the next four days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your continuous support. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Please. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, we close the opening ceremony of our conference and we move to the first scientific part, the opening plenary session. And uh, for the opening plenary session, I would like to welcome now here on stage the chairperson for the open plenary, which is my colleague from EFSA, Barbara Galani. Barbara, please. Hey, Barbara. Hey, good luck. Thank you. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the One Conference, uh, One Health, One Environment uh, and One Society. I will have the pleasure over the next uh, three hours uh, to introduce the speakers uh, that will be with us uh, today, either online or in person. 
And the aim uh, of this plenary session is to consider how risk assessment frameworks uh, in the areas of food, uh, health uh, and the environment uh, can be adapted uh, for future needs. The first uh, part uh, of the afternoon will be made of uh, a keynote uh, lecture, which will be delivered uh, through a recorded video. And then four uh, speeches uh, that uh, will be true online and true in person. The second part uh, will be a keynote lecture in person, followed by a moderated uh, panel uh, discussion. As there are so many of you in the audience uh, here in uh, Brussels uh, and connected online, and it's fantastic uh, to see this, uh, I'd be very keen to hear what uh, uh, the uh, discussions and interventions on stage uh, stimulate, uh, what sort of thoughts uh, are brought up, what sort of reflections from your sides. And I would invite you to use uh, the events app uh, to send comments uh, and questions uh, that might be addressed uh, by the panel discussion uh, later uh, today. And uh, if there isn't time for that, uh, you can take uh, those points uh, into the next uh, three days. So, as uh, Bernard uh, Earl uh, said, uh, his wish us uh, inspiration, unplanned, fortunate uh, discoveries, uh, and rewarding human encounters. And it's in this spirit uh, that uh, I'm pleased uh, to introduce uh, the first uh, uh, speaker for today. As I said, it's a pre-recorded video that was submitted by Professor Jessica Fanzo, uh, who is the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Global Food Policy and Ethics. Uh, titles don't get any longer than this, I think. <laughs> Um, Vice Dean of the Faculty uh, of uh, Affairs uh, at the John Hopkins University, where she is also Director of Global Food Policy and Ethics uh, Programme. Professor Fanzo has been working with the uh, World uh, uh, Food Programme, with the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization and with many global uh, institutes. Uh, and uh, what uh, she has pre-recorded for us uh, is uh, something about the lessons learned uh, on how food systems respond to shocks and the interconnections uh, of uh, human health, uh, animal health, uh, and the environment. Professor Jessica Fanzo. Hello, my name is Jess Fanzo, and I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins University. I'm really sorry I cannot be there in person. Today, I'm going to talk about from safe food to sustainable food systems. So let's get started. So what are the impacts of shocks on food systems? We call these shocks the three C's, climate, conflict, and COVID. Well, we know that conflict, the Ukraine-Russia crisis, along with many protracted crises, weather extremes related to climate change, and economic shocks due to the pandemic are all increasing the number of people who are in serious food crisis. And those numbers of people have been increasing over the last several years. This map shows you the number of people in food crisis um, around the world with much of that being in Sub-Saharan Africa, some parts of the Middle East and, and North Africa and into Asia. So we're seeing an increase in the number of people who are significantly food insecure, um, in some places, potential starvation due to the recent food price crises. Well, climate change is one of the big drivers of food uh, insecurity and poor nutrition. Um, climate change is and will continue to have an impact on the ability for us to grow enough crops uh, to feed the world. This is a map showing you in a very warmer world, a three degree scenario world. You can see that in much of the South shown in red, there'll be declines in crop yields of a variety of crops. So climate change, if not addressed, will continue to have significant impacts on the ability for farmers to grow crops, ability of ranchers and pastoralists to raise their animals. We also know that um, in a high CO2 fertilization, a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere or greenhouse gas, there will be potential declines in the nutritional quality of a variety of crops. This is showing you a map of where that nutritional quality could be altered with declines in protein, declines in iron, and declines in zinc. 
And with many parts of the world being affected, it's not just concentrated in the global south. And some of these impacts could see a cumulative effect of 15 to 20% declines in these key micronutrients. At the same time, food systems are contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. The way we grow our food, the way we move, produce, package our food is all having impacts on greenhouse gas emissions. That's not only methane coming from cattle digestion, but methane from rice, emissions from manure and pasture management, land use changes like deforestation, et cetera. And so food systems are contributing to somewhere between, depending on which study you look at, 21 to 37 percent total greenhouse gas emissions. But food systems are also detrimental to many natural resources, freshwater resources. Agriculture uses 70 percent. Biodiversity collapse and extinction. Marine fish stocks maximally fished. So we're seeing not only that climate change will have an impact on food systems, but food systems in turn are contributing to the rapid uh, acceleration of, of climate change. The Ukraine-Russia conflict, food, fuel, feed, uh, fertilizer are all being impacted with the conflict happening in these two countries because Russia and Ukraine are big Bread baskets, major food exporters. They export a lot of, of safflower oil, wheat, barley for feed, corn, you name it. Both of them are significant contributors to, to global food security. And this Russia crisis, uh, or Ukraine crisis, has seen rise in food prices across all cereals, all foods, a lot of oils. And, and this is having a significant impact on, on vulnerable populations that rely on those imports of foods um, and, and uh, poor populations who spend a lot of their money, uh, their income on food. We see the DRC, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Yemen, Egypt is a, also a hard hit by this crisis. And last, the third C is COVID. Zoonotic pandemics are not going anywhere. We will see another in our lifetime, most likely. 60% of emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic, and of that 60%, 70% come from wildlife. Well, food and agriculture are playing a big role in that they uh, are uh, increasing the risk of zoonotic spillover events because agriculture is a, a risk for destruction of natural habitats, shrinking of natural habitats that put wildlife in closer proximity to domestic animals and humans, increasing the risk of zoonotic disease emergence. And COVID has also had an impact on the ability for people to access healthy diets and, and a significant impact on malnutrition. This is data that just came out this, uh, this past year showing that with COVID, people cannot really afford a healthy diet and that number has been increasing and rising over the pandemic period as compared to a no COVID scenario. So we see that um, the access to healthy diets, not only physical access, but economic access has really impacted COVID. And the conflict in the Ukraine, Russia uh, areas have exacerbated this, this cost of diets. So what are the consequences of some of these shocks? Well, climate change is a threat to food security. Uh, this is showing you different scenarios with SSP3 being no action on climate change, which there's not enough currently. And it shows that over time, populations at risk of hunger will rise with climate if no action is taken. We also know that diets are not adequate. They are suboptimal for much of the world's population. And because of that, have become the top risk factor of morbidity and mortality in the world, which is ast astonishing that diets, which are meant to nourish us, are now killing us. And because of that, malnutrition is getting worse. 811 million people go to bed hungry. We still have a significant proportion of children who are stunted and wasted in the world. And on top of that, 2.2 billion people are overweight or obese. These numbers are not improving. They're worsening. And the question is, why? Well, a lot of it is the three Cs, but a lot of it is other reasons. Governance, political, uh, geopolitics, you name it, 
there's significant multifactorial issues at play in why we're seeing malnutrition worsening around the world. One of the reasons is because people cannot afford a healthy diet. As I said earlier, this is a map showing you where people cannot afford a healthy dark diet, the dark brown being 75 to 100% of the world's population not being able to afford a healthy diet. You can see that in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And this uh, work done by FAO, Anna Herforth, Will Master and colleagues show that 3 billion people cannot afford a healthy diet. Well, how do we go from safe food to sustainable food systems? What are the macro steps we need to take? And this, of course, I only have 15 minutes. So I'm going to end in my last five minutes with five major things that I think need to happen at the global level. But I want to preface that by saying it's not easy to transform food systems. As you can see from this food system framework, there's many components and actors that are interacting with food systems. Components are at play with each other with positive and negative feedback loops. We have many drivers outside food systems that are shaping and shifting food systems in different directions. And we want a lot from our food systems. We want them to improve the environment, improve nutrition and health, improve livelihoods in the economy, and ensure social equity and inclusion. So we're asking our food systems to do a lot. And they're under stress. They're strained. They're fragile, as you saw from my first part of my presentation. And it's complex to change them, to move them away from the iceberg. So we need to be thinking about all the actors and all the components at play and the trade-offs that come with decisions made in food systems. My first recommendation is that we need to systematically embrace a One Health approach to food systems. There's been a lot of talk about One Health, there's been a lot of theorizing, but we need to put this One Health approach into practice, the animal environment human interface. We need to think about how we do better health and food system surveillance. We need to think about the integration of these shared environments that animals, the environment and human have. We need to think about better policy legislation and governance around this One Health approach. And of course, investing in One Health on the ground in places with communities where it matters most. We need to take a business unusual approach if we want to achieve the Paris climate targets. Now, food is largely ignored in the COP negotiations. But without integrating food into negotiations and taking real action on food systems, we will not stay below two degree. We will not, definitely will not stay below 1.5 degree. And this blue graph show you the different actions we can take across food systems, increasing yields of foods, having food waste, food loss and waste in half, cutting it in half, eating calories that are sufficient for your needs and not going beyond that, more sustainable farm practices, plant-rich diets, plant-dominant diets. Now, each of these bar graphs get us closer to the Paris targets, but are not sufficient. We need to do all of them, shown in green, at, at least partially or fully, if we want to stay below uh, 1.5 degrees. So it's not just one thing. We need to do multiple things across food systems, and we need to do them quite adequately, or at least fully, if we want to stay um, in a cool world. And we have solutions for all of these. There's tangible solutions that individuals can take, corporations can take, and governments can take on. The third thing is we need to ensure that we put evidence and data in the hands of policymakers so they can make informed decisions. We launched something called the Food Systems Dashboard with the Food Systems Countdown Initiative to bring together the highest quality data across food systems in visually appealing way ways with performance metrics for policymakers to better keep track of how their food systems are performing and to make evidence sound decisions moving forward. The fourth, we need to get over our staple fetish and diversify our agriculture systems, diversify our diets. 
we have roughly 5,500 crops that can be consumed in the world, but 50% of the world's calories comes from rice, maize, and wheat. And over time, we've re re really homogenized our agriculture system and have abandon some of the traditional crops that are so important in places like Africa and Asia and Latin America, and have really consolidated our agriculture systems to grow a handful of, of grains, a handful of, of oils and sugar. And most of our subsidy policies look that way, subsidizing cereals and starches, oils and fats and sugar, and not really what we want people to be consuming, more emphasis on fruits and vegetables, legumes, nuts, and seeds. We need to change the way our agriculture policies are oriented to allow and incentivize farmers to diversify their crops and the landscapes in which we rely on for our diets. We can see that the reliance on a handful of crops like wheat has been detrimental with the Ukraine-Russia crisis, and it's, it's exposed that fragility. And last, we need to learn from COVID. We have so many lessons of how we should protect food system workers across the entire value chain, how we need to put in better surveillance mechanisms for zoonotic spillover events, how we need to work together in a multilateral cooperative way if we want to address pandemics, climate, and other we are all in this together kind of problems. We need all governments to take action, be engaged and be incentivized. So we have so many lessons to learn from the COVID pandemic. We just need to put them into practice and not fall into the same entrenched issues that we've had for so long on food systems. If we want to achieve not only sustainable food systems, but healthy and safe food systems, for everyone. And I very much look forward to the conference and the rest of the speakers. And I wish everyone an engaging, uh, collaborative uh, environment and time here at the, at, the, at the event. Thank you so much. Well, quite a fitting opening. Uh, very rich in content, uh, in data, and in points uh, for discussion that I'm sure you will take into the sessions uh, over the next uh, three days. And uh, I'm very pleased now to move on to the first uh, of uh, our pitches. And uh, we have uh, connected uh, online, and I'd like to welcome you, uh, Glindis Virginia Luciano. Uh, Glindis is an interdisciplinary scientist uh, working specifically on alternative proteins, uh, meat consumption, and uh, she was uh, discovered uh, by our trainees uh, at EFSA, and it's thanks to their suggestion and thanks to them making contact with you, Glindis, that uh, uh, you have agreed to be on the program. Uh, you are the Network and Strategic Engagement Manager at uh, YPAD, uh, the Young Professionals for Agriculture Development. And you believe uh, that the democratic participation of youth uh, is crucial to transform food production, access uh, and consumption patterns uh, in the fight uh, against uh, climate change. I'm really, really curious uh, uh, about uh, your intervention and I'd like to welcome uh, you to Brussels uh, uh, remotely and uh, uh, Glindis Virginia Luciano. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. So let's get to it. Can food be safe, nutritious, and sustainable? So right now we're staring at a plate of pasta. We can see here some tomato sauce, some spices. But depending on who you are as a person, if you're more of a health, nutrition um, conscious individual, you might be looking more at the calories, macronutrients breakdown, percentage of carbs, of protein, of oils, perhaps how the dish makes your body feel, if you like it, if there should be some improvements next time to this pasta dish. But depending on your background, how you're staring at your plate might be different. You might have a different perspective. While the macronutrients and calories are very important for the human body, you might also think of your dish as carbon footprint. How far did my food travel? Do workers get a fair wage? 
Were there good farming practices? Were there any human rights violations? Were there high animal welfare standards? And of course, if you are a young person, knowing that we will face the most dire consequences of climate change, it is hard not to think when looking at your plate of the number 1.5 degrees Celsius. For anyone involved in topics related to food systems, climate, etc., it's hard to escape this number. I would say almost impossible. Especially as a young person working in food systems, the harsh reality is that food production and diet are a main contributor to environmental degradation. And so it is no surprise at all why there's a growing trend, not just in the market, of course, of towards consumption of low resource intense, or as we like to call, climate friendly diets. This is in line, of course, with youth demands in global major dialogues, such as the UNFSS, where sustainable healthy diets were heavily highlighted and emphasized. Once again, at COP26, where food was not definitely on the agenda, Jungo's Agriculture and Food Working Group demanded for climate-friendly food at the COP. And took part in a global youth statement in which sustainable food production practices, as well as low resource diets were mentioned. Moreover, Act for Food, Act for Change held a consultative process in which more than 100,000 youth from across the globe participated. The top two demands, sustainable healthy diets and access to healthy and nutritious food. These demands make sense when reading the UN 2021 Methane Assessment Report, in which it stated that we need to see 45% cuts to methane in this decade to stay within the 1.5 degrees Celsius. Given that animal agriculture is a leading methane producer, of course, switching to plant-based diets is a solution that will allow us to stay at 1.5 degrees Celsius. And of course, it really is a no-brainer as to why youth are demanding for governments to stop subsidizing industries that would not help achieve our global goal and instead invest in green technologies and look towards agroecology for sustainable farming production systems. Now, sustainability, we've already heard this word quite a couple of times already, and it's just the beginning of, uh, of the conference. And of course, this work continually, continuously morphs and shifts and changes. However, please bear with me as I use it a couple of more times. Now we're speaking, of course, of sustainable food systems, but I want you to imagine a sustainable plate. This plate is composed of good policymaking that has adopted a framework that considers the true cost of food, meaning all costs are internalized, that produces within planetary and environmental boundaries, that respects human and animal rights, good investments, knowledge, and information sharing. Major points within this framework of thought is echoed in the latest IPCC report, which stated that the lack of global cooperation coupled with the lack of governance around land and energy transformation and increases in resource intense consumption are viewed as key impediments to achieving the 1.5 degrees Celsius pathways. We already have the information and data that we need to know how to proceed. And so to have nutri and so of course, when we ask, is it possible to have nutritious and sustainable foods? Well, with the right policies, investments, and change narrative of what successful food production looks like, then yes, I do believe it's possible. And I know many of my youth peers believe it's possible. Now, looking at the sustainable plate once again, it is quite visible that there's an overarching theme when we look at these different aspects that are connected to the sustainable plate, and that's food safety. We know that climate change is connected to sustainable and safe food production, 
The effects of climate change, as we already know and have heard countless of time, compounded with the increase of demand of food, has pushed our environment beyond its tipping points. There's loss of biodiversity, soil erosion, all of which have created further challenges to ensure food safety. And of course, various reports have found that climate change is a driver of foodborne diseases. With changes in climatic conditions, we could actually see in the future that there will be favorable environments for potential pests, as well as harmful microorganisms and environments. The changes are being sped up, of course, by agricultural production, and this was also highlighted by the previous speaker. And so as we talk about sustainable food systems, we inherently need to include food safety, food security, and nutrition, as these topics cannot be decoupled. Now, going back to the sustainable plain framework, it sounds complicated, but as citizens, academics, activists, and so on, we have the ability to add to the conversation, demand more from our institutions, to better reflect our goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And it can begin by looking at our plates. And so, I leave you with two questions to reflect on. How will you view your plate next time? And how can you ensure that your plate is safe, nutritious, and sustainable? Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank Glendis, very much. Uh, for highlighting many different aspects uh, of food production and consumption and uh, for throwing a challenge at us. Uh, uh, about personal choices uh, and uh, how they can influence uh, uh, societal improvements uh, or otherwise. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, that you were able to join us uh, and uh, I'd like to continue to engage with you uh, in more than one way. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like uh, now to introduce uh, the next uh, speaker, uh, also from the US. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Frank Ayanes, uh, uh, the D Deputy Commissioner for Food Policy and Response uh, at the U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Agency, U.S. Uh, FDA. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Mr. Ayanes is, in effect, uh, the agency's uh, chief ambassador to reduce food safety risks uh, and achieve high rates uh, of compliance uh, with FDA food safety standards. Uh, before joining uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, FDA in December 2018, he was uh, working with two uh, big uh, uh, industry uh, giants, uh, Walmart uh, and the Walt Disney Company. And uh, I've heard him saying before that uh, in more than 30 years uh, working on food safety, the most valuable commodity that he found uh, is consumer trust. I'm looking forward uh, to your intervention, and the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Frank Ayanes. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Granted, I wish I could be with you in person, uh, but I'm delighted to join you remotely. The topic I've been asked to present today in the very brief time we have together is this issue that actions speak louder, the battle for trust, and especially the battle for consumer trust. Uh, I think this topic is extremely timely given uh, where we're at as, as a society. I think it's certainly timely for our profession and as you will see, I think it's an extremely relevant and timely topic for food. But I'd like to start by doing something a little bit less traditional and start by asking you a question. What do you think these four topics or issues have in common? One, uh, the current economic climate and what consumers around the world are thinking about uh, inflation in the future economies in the countries that they live in political scandals. Uh, I realize that many of you are in Europe. Uh, they probably don't happen in Europe, but they do happen in other countries around the world. That's a joke. Um, how about misinformation or disinformation and the fact that anybody can become a reporter at any time using platforms and tools such as social media? Or food scares. These happen to be pictures of issues we've been dealing with, fresh leafy green outbreaks or concerns over the safety of infant formula. What do these four things have in common? Well, in my view, they all, and many issues in today's society, have an underlying key theme, and that's this, that we are living through what I believe 
is a, a, a mega consumer trust bust, mega consumer trust bust. And social scientists tell us uh, that because we live in today's society, in today, in our moment in history, many consumers are less trusting than institutions, many institutions that you and I represent, less trusting of governments, less trusting of companies, of uh, corporations, uh, even of nonprofits. And it's a function of the times that we live in. On top of that, social scientists tell us that there's increased polarization happening in many countries and societies around the world. People are now increasingly polarized. We know they're polarized on issues of politics. Uh, we know they might be polarized on things that we think shouldn't be so uh, debatable, such as climate change or how to deal with the pandemic. How about food? Do you think we as a society are increasingly polarized on food? I think the answer is yes. Let me illustrate to you a uh, North American perspective. I was raised in the 1970s in the United States. And when I was growing up uh, here in the US, we used to think that food united us. We rallied as a country around the issues of food. We loved our hot dogs and apple pie. We rallied around our favorite sports, baseball, and uh, sometimes even around our favorite automobiles. Back at that time, uh, US Chevrolets. But what do we see today? After three decades in the profession, I'm sad to say that I increasingly see food dividing us. We hear people talk about, I want local full food. And some people saying, I'm okay with global food. Frank Giannis personally is pro-global and pro-local, where all of the world feeds the rest of the world. Some people say, I want my organic food. And some people say, I'm okay with conventional food. It tends to be a little bit more affordable. We hear debates about, I eat only natural, and some people are okay with processed foods. I like natural foods. I also like processed foods. I'm of Greek descent, and so I still love my Greek yogurt. I love wine. I love bread. I love cheeses. They're all processed foods. And today, we have an issue uh, in many countries around the world, certainly the planet, with too food being as much as a harm as too little food. And so food is increasingly dividing us, in my view, and I think food shouldn't divide us. I think food as a society, as a country, and as a global effort should unite us. I also was raised, and as I went to school, uh, put a lot of emphasis on hope in food science as the world population grows, as climate change start to increasingly affect us. Placing hope in science as one of our solutions to creating a safer, more sustainable, and available food system. But today, we hear people concerned about science, saying, I don't want science in my food. I'm okay with science in my handheld device, but I certainly don't want it in my food. And so at FDA, we've been working on something that we call a new era of smarter food safety. A new era of smarter food safety. Uh, it's this idea that in these modern times that we live in, we're going to need more modern approaches. And when it comes to trust or building or strengthening trust in food, this is increasingly important. There are a lot of headwinds ahead of us. I wish I had time to talk about this issue of trust and how we as food system leaders and stakeholders can strengthen and build trust. I wish I could talk to you about new models of distributed and decentralized trust, which I'm convinced is the way forward because single institutions have failed consumers in many instances. I wish I could talk to you about the behavioral sciences and how we might leverage some of the principles that behavioral scientists and social scientists tell us uh, make things more believable, such as the principle of authority, who's an influencer, what makes principles more believable. But in the time I have here today, I'm gonna speak to you about this issue of action speak loudest, because what we say about food safety matters, what we write about food safety matters, but it's not what matters most, it's what we do. And I'm gonna give you two examples of things we're doing at FDA that we think ultimately will result in increased consumer trust. And the first one is food traceability. Uh, a couple of years ago, we proposed a food traceability rule in the United States, and we're in the process of issuing a final rule this year, later in November. Now, why is food traceability important? We know from a food safety perspective, if there's a food scare, tracing that food back to source quickly can allow us to remove the product from the market. Not only remove product from the market, but presumably uh, shorten the epidemic curve, a form of secondary prevention, prevent additional illnesses, 
Uh, but ultimately, we believe better food traceability is more than just food safety. It's about transparency. And we believe transparency, increasing transparency in the food system will be breed trust. What's the opposite of transparency in food? I wish I was in front of you so I could hear the audience respond. But to me, it's what we have in today's food system. Too much anonymity. We really don't know where those products come from. We really don't know what they're produced, under what conditions, what certifications have they truly been identified to conform with. And consumers certainly don't know this. And so I believe that food traceability is just one action that we can take to increase transparency in the food system and ultimately enable greater trust by all food system stakeholders. The second action that we're working on is one involving data. I often like to say that better food safety, better food systems, more efficient and sustainable food systems will begin and end with better data, quality data. The reality is we're living in the 21st century called the digital and data age. And we have at our grips the possibility of using tools to convert large volumes of big data that exist and converting it into very actionable, prescriptive, preventive information. There's this big divide, but new tools such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, distributed ledger technology, the internet of things, are causing this divide to close. And I believe that we as food system leaders have to change our paradigm on collaboration for the 21st century to instill greater trust. In the 20th century, we often said that food safety and food requires collaboration, and that meant that Smart men and women came around a table, talked about the food system issues, they shared best practices, and we defined that as collaboration. In my view, that's a very old paradigm or view of collaboration. In the 21st century, the data age, we believe that collaboration will increasingly involve data sharing. Public to public data sharing, private organizations and public organizations sharing data, and using that data to convert it to information and the entire food system or all food system stakeholders getting smarter together as opposed to individual entities or units getting smarter alone. And so at FDA, we're working on this issue of data sharing and data trust uh, and have started up a few key projects uh, uh, to do just that. In closing, uh, I wanna leave you with this thought. Never before in history has the responsibility to provide safe, available and sustainable food to so many rested on the shoulders of so few. And never before in history have the consequences for not getting this right been more important. Thank you for what you're doing to create a safer, more sustainable and trusted food system. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. Ayanas, uh, for being with us uh, today and uh, for giving us uh, some uh, take uh, on trust and its different elements. Uh, so traceability, transparency and data sharing uh, will be dealt with uh, in many parallel sessions uh, at the conference uh, here today. And I know that uh, there are many of your colleagues from the US that are able to be here uh, in person, so I'm sure that we'll have uh, interesting exchanges with them. And you've also whetted our appetite uh, on models for decentralized trust uh, behavioral science, uh, which will also be covered uh, during the conference uh, in the One Society uh, stream. So thank you for your inspiring words uh, and for the encouragement, uh, uh, because we're all doing uh, as uh, good a job as we can uh, to uh, ensure the safety of food uh, for citizens uh, globally. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We move to the two uh, in-person <laughs> speakers. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm welcoming on stage uh, Professor Jacqueline Bruce, uh, Professor of Innovation and Communication in the Health and Life Sciences uh, and Director of the Athena Institute uh, at the Faculty of Science. Uh, you make it really difficult for me <laughs> with all these titles. Well, I'm sorry. At uh, Vrije University in Amsterdam. Yeah. And uh, I'm really curious to hear uh, your speech because uh, you're a researcher and an advocate for a radical shift uh, towards public participation in science, uh, open science, uh, and citizen science. Yes. Yeah. 
So uh, the floor is yours, uh, Professor Jacqueline Bruce. Thank you very much for the introduction. <laughs> and also, great to be here. An honor, but also a real pleasure to be here live. And um, I'm going to try to see if the slides work. How does it work? The technology, yes. Um, my presentation will focus on the topic of science communication. And my main message, the take home message, will be that we need to rethink science communication. We need to move beyond the deficit of thinking and also beyond dialogue and enter into a reflective participatory practice. Let me start by saying why. Um, our interaction with science and society is increasingly complex and challenging. There are two developments that are mainly responsible for that. First of all, we see the blurring of boundaries. Science used to be quite an isolated activity, ivory tower. Luckily, we as scientists go out more and more. We are also more called upon, like help us try to solve the big challenges that come towards us. They're coming bigger and bigger. However, science to some extent can help. We have seen lots of improvements, but at the same time, science does not always deliver on its promise. Less effective than we hoped for, sometimes even with negative side effects. Also, scientists don't always agree. So we see conflicting ideas about facts. As a result, we do see reduced levels of trust over the years in science. So, science has a promise, but also science to be something to be wary of. And that's all exacerbated by the second development, and that's the development of the digital revolution. We can access information everywhere, at any time we want to, in abundance. However, we can also produce, generate information and put it on the internet ourselves. Without any quality control, there's no fact-checking going on. So how do you know what is real, what is true, what is not? And these developments really complicate our science communication. Now, there are two ideologies, basically, at the moment, that are dominant. It's the conventional one, it's the deficit model, based on scientific expertise, and we see that basically the public is seen as in need of knowledge, which is in many cases true, right? Because the public usually has some deficit in knowledge, say, about risks, food safety. So it, there, it is important for science to communicate to the public. However, when there are concerns and, well, criticism towards science, it's usually framed as, again, there's not enough knowledge in society. So we need to communicate more. That's usually then what we call the deficit thinking. The answer to the problem, the answer to the lack of trust, is communicate more. Unfortunately, in such a situation of trust, just communicating more is not going to do it. And we have seen lots of studies that show that it doesn't rebuild trust. So, another model, more participatory, is the idea of dialogue. Acknowledging different forms of expertise, putting people together, discussing about the different perspectives, the different values, learning from one another. That's the idea of dialogue. However, how to deal in dialogues with increasing alternative facts? When there is more conflict, more opposition, that becomes more difficult to come to consensus. How to deal with it? It is complicated in a dialogue setting to do that. And the other thing is that we see that dialogues are often taking place in isolation. Um, they are not really linked to decision making. So, what happens afterwards? What about the follow-up? How to do that? So, what do we do then? If we're thinking about this, I would like to take you to the experience I have with our Dutch um, national risk assessment agency that is experimenting with these kinds of things. 
they are, so they came to us and asked, can you assist in improving our communication? Our communication, not so much towards policymakers, we are pretty happy about that, but especially our conversations with the public. We do that quite a lot, we need to do better, and we run into problems if we try to do it. So, um, we went to the public, we had quite a number of focus group discussions with the public, and just to give you an in a nutshell, the results, is that first of all, the public really feels at a distance. And that's, if they come across the messages, well, just, just to show you one, commonly used food products such as rice, pasta, cornflakes and sprinkles often contain possibly carcinogenic substances yeah, due to food packaging. Now, how do you want to make sense of this? Um, many of you might be, have more expertise, but, and this is not an exception. So, actually, if we're talking about the deficit model, well, there is a lot to improve on the communication itself. The one-way communication can improve a lot. Secondly, the public said, well, they're so defensive. If there is a crisis and they are being uh, put at a spot, uh, actually, they hardly ever um, talk back. Uh, there's just uh, reports or press releases, but they don't start a conversation. They are quite defensive and evasive. And if they say anything, it's, don't worry. Another point was that they said, actually, where we communicate, they are not there. Yeah, so they're only using very few outlets. So we also talked, of course, more to the public authorities themselves, the staff members. And they came up with this one. Well, um, we, we, we find it difficult to communicate also with the conventional media because they are so much sensationalist. We, we, it's difficult to interact with. We rather not do it at all, as a matter of fact. The second one was, we can't really openly go into the public domain because we have our communications department to do that. They are specialized in it, they have rules and regulations on how to do it, and they take care of it. They release the reports, they do the press releases and everything. We sit back, sit back, we don't go into these dialogues ourselves. We don't do that. It's not a good idea. Um, and it also, what you notice that it was, there was lots of knowledge, well, reasonably, about the one-way communication, but the whole idea of dialogue was not within the uh, organization at all. There was really very few competencies on it. Last but not least, when we asked the, the, the ones that are doing the assessments to go into this dialogue, they said, well, yeah, but, but what are you going to talk about? If we, we, want to send the inf we want to send the information, but if they talk back and they challenge us, well, what does it mean for our role? If we're not the senders, if we are not the experts anymore who bring in true knowledge, we're just another opinion. And that doesn't sit good, we were the independent experts. So here we see that actually the, the, the identity is at stake here. Then I would like to answer this one by saying, well, first of all, this true knowledge is a myth anyway. Yeah, so forget about it. Because scientific knowledge is full of uncertainty. We work with uncertain numbers and facts. We work with uncertain models, assumptions, based on assumptions. They are mimicking reality, but they are not reality. And predicting the future is also extremely complicated, even more so than the rest. So, what we could say is that how to communicate uncertainty. And it's not all uncertain, so it's important to know what we do know for certain, what we don't know for certain, and why. So it needs to talk more about the process of science itself. Another thing is that we need to look more at the practice of the public, how they make sense of this uh, information and reality. So sense-making is the process by which we develop an understanding of the complex reality, and it's not just based on knowledge. Knowledge is just a small part. It's about the individual situation. It's about values, it's about worldviews that all come in. And to that sense, science is just another opinion in that whole portfolio, let's say. 
But for communicators, this sense-making process and getting a better understanding of it is critical. Because we do need to know how people make sense of it if we take it up in our risk assessment process. And that's what I would like to turn now to, because the criticism that dialogue is at fault because it's just one-off events means that the dialogue should become a component of the risk assessment process. So, actually, with our work with the agency, we um, started with them to look for models that would much better do that. We came across, at that point, the risk governance model, which is, of course, developed around yeah, 20 2010. Uh, this one uh, th that I'll show later on, specifically from 2013, in which it is explicitly acknowledged that risk assessment and its outcomes are a social construct. That we may have facts, but that how we interpret it, what we do with the outcomes, is socially constructed. And that involvement of stakeholders is critical throughout the process, from the beginning, and to, to build more robust knowledge. Now, this is what it would look like starting in the middle with the communication throughout the entire process, all types of media, defining the problem together, and then doing two types. Here is also where the social sciences come in. The risk assessment is about the scientific evidence, but not in isolation, in all its facets, not just health, but also environment, etc. Concerns assessment, looking at what the public finds important, what their perceptions, values are, looking at where the social unrest will be, because we know certain topics are likely to be more controversial and steer unrest than others. And it's very important for an agency to be prepared in advance and not to be every time, that's what this agency was there, they felt overwhelmed when the next crisis came along. Here is where the dialogue comes in. At this point, where things are really need to be integrated, all the knowledge needs to be brought together and come up with then the evaluation that's going to be implemented. But don't forget, this model was already about 10 years ago. Are we there yet? No, not at all. So acknowledging this, having a model, having guidelines on how to do it, won't do it. And that's because it's really a totally different way of working. And we many times we say, we need to, to change practice, we need to do it differently. But it is so incredibly difficult to have the infrastructural and cultural changes needed. We need new competencies, and that's what actually this agency started to do. Okay, we're going to train staff in this, giving them tools, having a, a, a unit that will help those that want to include the public more. And we need experiments, but just experiments through these reflexive participatory learning cycles, action cycles, is good. We need to do it, we need to do it more, but to bring it further, we, that really requires leadership, courage. So, EFSA. <laughs> I think, you have to be ready for taking this up. I think the ideas are there, but now we need to get going, right? <laughs> so, wishing you a very, very insightful and uh, inspiring conference, and that we will have a wonderful action plan coming out, then we can get this really moving. Let's get going. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I think we should do it, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll try, we'll try our best <laughs> uh, and, okay. and we'll do it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. Uh, and uh, uh, the last speaker for this session uh, is uh, Professor Sarah Hartley. And uh, she's professor at the Department of Science, Technology and Innovation at the University of Exeter in the UK. And uh, I'd like to welcome you on stage, and I'm really interested to hear your research on the efforts uh, to bring inclusivity and diversity to biotechnology risk assessment. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so
So I'm a social scientist studying risk assessment, and I've been looking at risk assessment in biotechnology for the last 20 years. I started looking at risk assessment in GM crops when they were an emerging biotechnology. Uh, I've looked at risk assessment since then in uh, GM animals, GM insects, gene editing, and more recently, I've delved deep into gene drive. I'm here talking to you today because of the increasing emphasis on collaboration and partnership, which you've already heard today, and I think you're going to hear a lot more about over the next few days. So I study risk assess engagement in risk assessment, and I do that in part with collaboration with risk assessors. So you've heard uh, talk about risk governance and the root and food systems, but today, I'm, well, my talk today, I'm just going to focus very narrowly on risk assessment. So, risk assessment and engagement have a bit of a tense history, in part because risk assessment is seen as the scientific or technical stage of the risk governance process, and engagement is seen to be concerned with values and perspectives. But uh, despite that tension, we still see engagement in risk assessment. We see public consultations on scientific opinions, and we see stakeholders embedded through mechanisms like the stakeholder platform. I see engagement in risk assessment as a way to increase the robustness of risk assessment, particularly given the complexity and uncertainty facing risk assessment. But I imagine something much more ambitious than we see today. I see signs that ESSA is embracing some of the new ideas about uh, engagement in risk assessment. Uh, we see that, uh, I think, uh, in the collaboration with social scientists, and the more collaboration we have with social scientists and risk assessors, we can start to build engagement into the institutions and mechanisms of risk assessment. I've got lots of ideas about engagement in risk assessment, but today I'm going to introduce you just to one. That's epistemic engagement. So, we, have, we know that motivations matter for engagement. Why do risk assessors want to engage? First, it could be to explain risk decisions, or it could be to explain uh, levels of risk. Perhaps it's to build trust or legitimacy that we've heard about today. However, engagement's a two-way interaction that involves listening and talking. So if all we're going to do is explain, we should use communication tools, not engagement tools. Perhaps engagement should be conducted because it's the right thing to do in a democratic society. Perhaps we should bring relevant interests into the room uh, and ensure that, that everybody has equal input into decisions to, to avoid bias. Maybe we should open up scientific opinions to public consultations to ensure transparency and openness. These are ideas we've already heard today. And this is what most people think about when they think about engagement and risk assessment. This is a type of democratic engagement, where a range of views and perspectives can shape decisions. This could also be a way to increase legitimacy decisions. But there's a third option that I want to talk to you about today. And that's where engagement is about making better decisions. Decisions by bringing different types of knowledge and expertise into risk assessment. Maybe to increase the robustness of risk assessment, particularly when we're faced with complexity, uncertainty, or even contention that characterizes regulatory science, which I know you're all familiar with. This is what I call epistemic engagement. It's a type of engagement that I want to think about today because it's particularly valuable for the highly scientific and technical stage of risk assessment. And here, engagement, engagement can make a substantive improvement to the quality of risk assessment. So what is epistemic engagement? Firstly, it involves both stakeholders and experts. In fact, if we look through uh, an epistemic engagement lens, if we think about epistemic engagement as a lens and we look at stakeholders, we see they're also experts. They also hold knowledge. They just provide a different type of knowledge. This type of knowledge is starting to be recognized at EFSA. And if you look at the slide here, you can see a quote from EFSA's stakeholder engagement approach, which says, the quality of EFSA's scientific assessments will be improved thanks to access to a wider evidence base and new knowledge or expertise. That's great. It recognizes that stakeholders do not just have views and perspectives, but they also have knowledge. And engaging their knowledge will increase the robustness of risk assessment. But what about experts? 
ESSA engages with experts to a much greater degree than with stakeholders. If we hold up that epistemic engagement lens again, we start to see engagement occurring in scientific committees, scientific panels, the external experts that assist EFSA with its scientific work. It also includes scientific studies that experts engage with in risk assessment. EFSA's new transparency regulation, for example, responds to citizen concerns about the diversity of science studies used to inform risk assessment in the case of glyphosate. These studies are also an important site of epistemic engagement. We know that experts don't just possess knowledge, but they also have views and perspectives. Sometimes we call this world views. World views can be even more pronounced in regulatory science, where there's greater degrees of uncertainty and complexity. And there's a great deal of evidence that shows experts can make different regulatory decisions based on the same science. Notable examples include alachlor, bovine growth hormone, and more recently, glyphosate. These controversies show decisions about which bodies of evidence to use and which methodologies to use can produce very different results. So epistemic engagement helps us to recognize that stakeholders are experts, and we're starting to see a shift in thinking about that. But it also helps us recognize that expert involvement is a type of engagement. Expert engagement is more institutionalized than stakeholder engagement, but it often flies under the radar when we think about engagement. We need to focus attention on the way in which experts are engaged. For example, more could be done to increase the diversity of knowledge, both across disciplines and within disciplines. We call this interdisciplinary and intradisciplinary diversity. It's one way to ensure that we have different worldviews in expertise. Epistemic engagement Engaging both stakeholders and experts for their knowledge is not about justice. It's not about doing the right thing. If we have too many people from the same background with the same worldviews, we risk what's called groupthink. And assumptions and blind spots can be left unchecked. Epistemic engagement helps to bring knowledge of diff different types of knowledge to bear on risk assessment and helps us avoid dangerous blind spots, gaps in knowledge. It can also help bring local knowledge and experiential knowledge into risk assessment. Together is better. We know that scientific excellence is not the sole criteria for selecting experts as either. Other criteria often include geographical location and gender representation. So it's not impossible to start thinking that greater inter- and interdisciplinary diversity could be achieved when engaging experts. I don't have time to tell you about all the research I've been doing uh, over the last few years on risk assessment and engagement. This is some of the work that's published. But I do want to tell you a little bit about some of the projects I have uh, ongoing at the moment. So my research team and I are involved with a couple of new projects which look at ep epistemic engagement in particular, and experimenting with potential of stakeholders uh, and new diverse forms of knowledge. A lot of this is in collaboration with risk assessors and gene drive developers. One project we have in collaboration with Jan Devos at EFSA is looking at different decisions involved with risk assessment and opportunities for epistemic engagement. This project includes gene drive developer target malaria, and we envisage risk assessment then as an exercise conducted not just by regulators uh, and risk assessors uh, in regulatory uh, agencies, but also by product developers. And here, uh, EFSA was tasked with evaluating the suitability of existing guidance at EFSA to cope with gene drive insects. It's a particularly interesting case in experimental terms because it's the first time in biotech that EFSA had done a, a stakeholder workshop upstream in advance of the scientific work. In another project, we're looking at stakeholder knowledge and risk assessment for gene drive squirrels, which have been proposed as a tool for invasive species management in the UK. This work builds on done and work. This work uh, project builds on work we've done in Uganda with stakeholders identifying risks associated with associated with gene drive mosquitoes. Both projects demonstrate the capability of stakeholders and the value of their contribution. In another project, we're looking at risk assessment for agricultural gene drive and how we can diversify knowledge through stakeholder and expert engagement in modeling and site selection. We know that modeling is playing an increasing role in risk assessment. We're seeing uh, much more evidence over that just in the last five years. And we also know that field trial sites have become hugely contentious. If we think about uh, genetically modified insects in Florida, 
uh, and, and other places in the world, these have been really sites of contention. So we're experimenting with diversifying the knowledge in, for example, in modeling, in identifying the parameters uh, and modeling, and seeing if stakeholders can play a role right at the start of the modeling process. We're also experimenting in the way that stakeholder knowledge can help identify different range of criteria for site selection for field studies. So in all of these projects, we're seeking to experiment with epistemic diversity and epistemic engagement. We don't claim to have all the answers, but experimenting will be key. And I do hope that over the next few days, I get a chance to meet some of you and talk about perhaps some of the experimental work you've done around engagement or some of the work and ways that you're thinking about uh, epistemic engagement. Uh, thank you for listening uh, today, but I do just want to thank my research team um, because this isn't something I do alone. Uh, I particularly want to thank Adam Kokocevic, who's really helped me uh, identify and work through this idea of epistemic engagement, and the British Academy, who fund uh, most of my work on risk assessment. And if you want to find more about, out about our work on risk assessment, you can go to our Gene Drive Governance website, where we have a number of papers uh, and outline the projects I've talked about today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. We've been following your publications uh, quite closely, and we're very interested in understanding the dynamics of engagement uh, and how engagement can help uh, in tackling uh, and addressing together complexity. So I found uh, the afternoon already quite uh, rich, and uh, we're going to have a break of about 30 minutes, uh, and we're going to reconvene uh, just uh, before 4 o'clock uh, for the second part of the afternoon. difficult to get you back into the auditorium after the coffee breaks. So I think this is going to be the most challenging thing of the conference. But uh, uh, we were expecting uh, to engage, uh, well, we are expecting to engage uh, with thousands of people based on the registrations uh, that we've received both in person and online. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, we're more than 400 uh, here in Brussels uh, today. And uh, we got uh, more than 1,000 people uh, connected online. So we're very pleased uh, and uh, we're very grateful that you're showing the support uh, for this uh, topic. And uh, the second part uh, of the afternoon will start uh, with uh, Patrick Wall, Professor of Public Health uh, at uh, University College Dublin uh, in Ireland. He was the first CEO of the Food Safety Authority of Ireland and the second chairperson of EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority. And uh, Patrick and I, pre-pandemic, uh, used to cross paths quite regularly as participants in many interesting global events. So I'm very, very pleased to welcome you on stage, uh, Patrick, uh, and the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's great to be at a face-to-face -face conference. And secondly, I'd like to uh, compliment EFSA and Bernard and his team for putting such an ambitious conference to, on for four days. Uh, so, um, and I'd like to compliment the sister agencies who helped, uh, helped uh, Bernard. We'll just put on the first slide, please, if we can. So um, they asked me to talk about uh, going forward together. And when you see the fact that we have uh, uh, four days of conferences, there's so many different speakers, and there's such an array of posters downstairs that you can see the different multidisciplinary professionals involved. You, we have to go forward together. There's a saying, if you want to go fast, uh, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So. Uh, uh, these are the issues that we have to look at uh, under the food safety umbrella, are some of the issues. Food security is a big one, uh, climate change, the impact of political conflict, the global village and the equivalence of standards and surveillance and laboratory capacity varies between jurisdictions, supply chain disruption and uh, food fraud. So basically uh, drought is uh, a huge issue for us and uh, climate change is impacting on us. And 
This needs uh, new plant diseases and new animal diseases, and this contributes to food insecurity. Uh, water is a scarce commodity now, and so therefore we, we, we are actually using non-potable water for irrigating crops, and now we see outbreaks associated with uh, contaminated water. And all you have to do is look in the supermarket shelves and see where your vegetables come from. They, they're globally sourced. We have everything is in season throughout the whole year. Uh, we need to produce more food for everybody. We need to feed a growing world population. And while we'd like to be able to produce food without any agrochemicals, we won't be able to do it in the short term anyway. And so we need... Um, plant health is under the One Health umbrella. You hear about... Uh, human health, animal health, and environmental health, but plant health is in there as well, and an awful lot of food is lost through plant diseases. And so we need safe plant protection products. We need products that are safe for the environment, we need no, no residues in the food, and we need safe products for the, the workers. And in many jurisdictions, the workers who, who spray the crops are not that well educated. Uh, we have a problem with the bees, and we need the bees. Without the bees, we're in trouble. Uh, waste. You know, it's a, a tragedy that we actually waste, um, we waste uh, enough food in the UK, for example, uh, and I'm not from the UK, in case anyone thinks I am. I'm, I'm a European <laughs> from Ireland. Uh, uh, even though Ireland is the shape of a teddy bear and the teddy's head belongs to the UK. But anyway, in the UK, they waste uh, enough food that would feed a country in Africa. And that's a terrible indictment on us all. So when we talk about food security, we can't ignore food waste. Uh, pollution in the sea, uh, microplastics and nanoplastics, hu hu huge issue for us. And uh, this was a, a whale that was washed up in Italy with 22 kilograms of plastic in his stomach. And so this is just a reflection of the state of the environment. Uh, food waste is, 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 is a huge issue, as I say, and uh, impacts on food security. And also, we're trying to recycle out of spec human food for animal food, and this brings with it some unique challenges that we have to manage. There's another form of food waste. Uh, if you're a man and your chest falls down to your belly, because you're obviously eating too much, but like uh, people are consuming too much uh, of the wrong food and also too much of the right food, and it's bizarre that we have one billion people in the world that are overweight or obese, and we have another um, uh, one billion suffering from protein, energy, malnutrition, and uh, uh, Professor Yanis said that uh, there's a divide with food, and there's a big example of it. Uh, also, when we talk about globally sourcing food, we want to make sure that we're actually not exploiting other countries. Uh, the developing countries, they need trade, not aid, but they need fair trade and uh, no exploitation. And, and uh, uh, Non-zoonotic diseases actually can impact on health, and so they can cause hunger. So there's Droughts contribute to famine or rinderpest or specific animal diseases can contribute to hunger in, in certain jurisdictions. With climate change, we're seeing uh, vector-borne diseases spreading, and so now we need to have uh, entomologists to help us. And so this is another competency under the One Health umbrella, which demonstrates that we can't travel the road alone. So whether we're going to use biological control as fish or uh, gene-edited mosquitoes, sterile male mosquitoes to control. These are the things that we can do, but we can only do this kind of work if we do it together. Uh, Non-zoonotic diseases disrupt supply chains, and we saw the issue with uh, African swine fever, decimated the pig population in China. The EU farmers responded to feed the Chinese, and we, were, we, we, we didn't anticipate how quickly the Chinese would recover, and so we have a surplus of pig meat in the EU now, with consequences for uh, prices of pig meat, viability of, of pig farmers, animal welfare, etc., etc. And the other side is foot and mouth disease and, and how we destroy the animals that are infected impacts on the environment. We, all, we talk a lot about farm to fork and um, in the Green Deal, we've mentioned it the whole time, but like the big word now is from soil to society. We need to look at soil, uh, how important soil is, and uh, whether it's uh, the chemical analysis of soil, the micronutrients in the soil. So a lot of soil is depleted from uh, overuse and soil erosion. Uh, physical composition of the soil. A lot of soil is impacted because of uh, heavy machinery. And finally, the biological, the microbiome of the soil is very, very important. And we never talk about the role grazing livestock and defecation of the soil has on this microbiome. And so we need to look at a much more holistic approach. Uh, we globally source animal feed, and this is a huge issue for us. This is a huge issue for us because 
problems can travel from one side of the world to the other. Basically, the ships arrive, the ships are offloaded, there's just-in-time delivery, and by the time we get the uh, results back from the analytical chemists, the grains have been incorporated into animal feed and possibly fed to the animals. And some of the biggest food scares we've had in the EU have been associated with contaminated animal feed. Getting a representative sample from a shipload of 50,000 is challenging. Uh, we have to feed the world, so we've got intensive farming. We couldn't feed the whole world uh, organically. So if we are going to go down the road of intensive farming, we've heard a lot in the COVID about congregated settings. Well, in veterinary, they talk about a high stocking rate. High stocking rate facilitates disease transmission. And when you have uh, a lot of animals together, uh, there's a risk of animal welfare, stress on the animals, stress on the animals cause disease, disease, antibiotics. Uh, so how are we going to use less antibiotics? Simple thing is to have healthier stock. And basically, healthier stock means uh, better nutrition, immunization, better biosecurity. But also, in the past, we've bred animals for food conversion efficiency, weight gain, milk yield, etc. Maybe we should be breeding for disease-resistant traits. Uh, also, many of us think that uh, antimicrobial resistance is a pathogen problem, or a pig problem, or a poultry problem. No, it's a people problem. So we need behavioral scientists to influence vets and, and farmers so that they don't actually use antibiotics, they adopt different practices. One big plus out of the uh, COVID is we've had an explosion in, uh, in laboratory capability to do PCR testing and sequencing, and everyone knows about variants of concern, and so we can now have the ability to link sporadic cases. We're now not looking at microbes, we're looking at gene sequences, and so we can look at antimicrobial resist gene sequences or that bugs are quite promiscuous with their genetic material and they share it. So we, now we talk about the mobile home. It's not a mobile home that you go on your holidays. It's genetic elements that they share. Uh, we can now go for source uh, attrition. We can track the bugs back from the patient all the way through the food chain to see where the non-compliance is. Sublethal stress is when you actually uh, make the bugs angry. They express, upregulate new genes with new traits. So these are new virulence factors or survivability traits. And so we now have an explosion in bioinformaticians. They were as rare as hen's teeth before COVID. And uh, these are the sort of things when you actually stress the bugs, they can express virulence factors, antimicrobial resistance, heat tolerance, or the ability to go dormant, or even uh, or form biofilms, which is really challenging for us. Animals as sentinels of environmental hazards. This is like the canary in the mine. Canaries are sensitive to oxygen depletion. If you were a miner and your canary fell over, that was the message to get out of the mine quick. But if you grow crops in, in polluted soil or in a polluted atmosphere, you can actually have residue in the crops. That bee, you think that's a worker bee? That's an environmental monitor. He has two uh, RFID on his back. And so how far can a bee fly on a good day with the wind behind him? Seven kilometers they can go to. And so therefore, wherever the bees forage, the pollutants appear in the, in the honey. And we've actually regularly had to stop honey in the EU because of heavy metal contamination. That's the bees as environmental monitors. Companion animals can be used as environmental monitors, sentinels of environmental hazards. The animals, their life is concertinaed, so they get those uh, chronic diseases like cancers, etc., much quicker than we do. So if your dog is getting lead poisoning, you need to worry about your kids. Uh, and basically, the melamine crisis in, in infant formula in, uh, in China, if we were collaborating better and sharing information, we would have been alerted to it a year earlier because there was a melamine crisis in pet food in, in the US because of the same additive. Uh, zoonosis control, obviously, is an issue. They can spread zoonosis. And then we don't underestimate the role of the emotional support that pets give their owners. And they say that during the lockdowns, older people with pets survived and, and fared better than people that didn't have pets. Producing the climate-friendly cow. People are concerned about livestock and ruminants producing methane. But basically, now we have the science to actually manipulate the microbiome of the cow the cow has four stomachs. The first stomach is like a fermentation vat, and you can manipulate the microbiome, adjust the methane-producing bacteria without affecting the cytolytic bacteria. And the idea you could actually, uh, with feed additives, changing the microbiome are genetically proved. And so that's what we need to be saying, rather than fighting the NGOs, we can say, well, look, we're working towards producing a climate-friendly cow. Biofortification is where you actually uh, Manipulate the final product, whereas the milk, the meat, or the eggs, by changing the animal's diet. So people say, well, uh, dairy products clog up your arteries, red meat causes cancer, or whatever, whatever. And so here's an example of a project that we're working on where we fed the broiler chickens uh, an ingredient with marine algae. And we've got chickens with uh, omega-3, EPA, and DHA concentrations that satisfy the EFSA claims. 
So we're encouraging everyone to eat oily fish because everyone is omega-3 deficient. However, there isn't enough oily fish in the sea, so it's not sustainable. Whereas if you do it this way, and also a lot of children don't like fish. They, they, like some people eat chicken three times a day. So this is just a common food. So you can actually change people's consumption patterns without having to change their behavior. Uh, during the COVID, we actually, it was interesting how we actually managed with science communication. And so there's lessons for us here. We actually, I think we should be a bit more ambitious with science communication. And we had dialogue in the social media. Everybody engaged. All of the journalists are now trained in all the terminology associated with infectious diseases. And so politicians are talking about sequencing the germs, you know, new variants of concern. It's amazing. And so I won't say anything about them. But anyway, they have, uh, so now we have the risk managers, the policy makers, everybody's familiar with the terms. So we need to build on this. And there was a digital media explosion and the regulators got in on the dialogue because we had to get in. Plenty of discussion in the, in the conventional media. We, when I was the chair of EFSA, the biggest problem we had was with the uh, environmental or the GMO panel. It was a panel that created the most grief for our communication section because it was so polarized. The biotech companies used to be given out that we weren't approving the varieties fast enough and the NGOs were saying we were reckless that we were approving them too fast. And at that time it was 18 months. But now this is my friend's 82 year old granny. She says she wants the messenger RNA vaccine. She doesn't want the conventional vaccine. So are, is genetic engineering a good thing or a bad thing? That's like saying that science is a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a tool. It's how we use it. We can deliver benefits for society. So maybe we can get a more enlightened discussion. So finally, one of the things about the, uh, uh, this uh, pandemic was that we actually shared information very well with each other, with the sister agencies of EFSA, the ECDC, the FAO, you name it. And so I, I remember that the Omicron strain was uncovered in South Africa on a Wednesday and we had the sequences in the EU uh, on the Friday and we identified the same strain in the EU. So that, that network of exchanging information on food, uh, basically we now need to share the information uh, and the standards. Some countries are a bit more advanced than others. We're now able to tr bring everybody with us and we have now have art artificial intelligence that, that can help us with risk assessments, managing big data. So the, the sky is the limit, like it's just a really good time to start talking about collaborations and working together. So finally, uh, I think One Health's time has come. I'm a, both a vet and a doctor, and I've been talking about One Health since I came out of the womb, but anyway, no, not that long. But like now everybody's into it and it's, it's the way forward. And, uh, and, and it can't happen unless we work together. And there's no one profession that has sole ownership. And so you can't say, trust me, I'm the doctor. No, everybody has something to bring to the table. And all you need to look at is the range of competencies that are speaking here and the range of competencies of the young people with the posters. And you'd say, we really, uh, this is the, our time. So have your surfboard squeezed up because the wave has come. And if you're not on it, you'll be left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick, uh, uh, for this uh, very broad uh, overview of the issues that we're, that we're facing, the challenges, the opportunities. Uh, and uh, it's uh, time now for the panel discussion. I'll leave you in very good hands uh, for this uh, with a professional moderator, editor of uh, AgraFacts, uh, therefore very familiar with the issues uh, and dossiers uh, that we'll be covering over the conference uh, over the next few days, uh, Rose O'Donovan. Thank you very much indeed, Barbara, for that very warm welcome. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this panel discussion, which forms the perfect segue after the keynote address of my fellow Irishman, Professor Patrick Wall's keynote. My name is Rosa Donovan, and I'm the editor-in-chief of the Brussels-based publication, Agrifax. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the theme of this session is what's next for food safety assessments. And I think you would agree that this debate is particularly timely and relevant Given that the One Health integrative approach is emerging as the key principle underpinning risk assessment. Just last week it emerged that the Commission's Directorate General for Health and Food Safety will have its own directorate dedicated to One Health, covering AMR and human nutrition from October 1st, reflecting once again the weight afforded to this very important concept. Now we have a lot to get through in the next hour or so, 
before I introduce my distinguished speakers, allow me just to go through some of the housekeeping rules, if I may. We're going to have a panel debate on what's next for food safety assessments with a cross-section of speakers until around 25 past five. Once each panelist has made their two-minute impulse statement, there will be a Q&A session between myself and the speakers, after which point I will open it up to the floor for questions. For those of you in the auditorium and those of you participating online, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions via the event applications chat function. Once you pose a question, be sure to introduce yourself and indicate to whom the question is addressed. And I will, of course, relay that question to the relevant speaker. We aim to wrap up the panel dis discussion at around 5.25 p.m., after which point Barbara, our wonderful chairwoman, will return on stage to briefly sum up the key take-home messages. And then we'll wrap up the session, as I say, at 5.35. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you all to give a very warm welcome to my distinguished speakers who will now join me on the podium. So, ladies and Bernard and Dirk. And please be seated. Very good. Just get comfortable. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce all of my distinguished panelists to, to you all. On my left here, I have Claire Berry, who is Deputy Director General of the Commission's DG on Health and Food Safety with responsibility for food sustainability. An English barrister by training, Claire is also a visiting professor at the College of Europe in Bruges. Welcome, Claire. Now, we have uh, Gitte Goetheland, who is a Swedish Social Democrat MEP, and I'm just going to test is she available online? Has she connected? I'm just looking at the technical team. Have I got a, a thumbs up there from Jan and Ed? No, not yet. We will return in a moment. Just for the moment, we are having a little bit of a trouble there with the connection. We'll return in an instant. Monika Goyens, who is with us on stage, Director General of the European Consumer Organization, Burke representing 46 independent national consumer associations in 32 European countries. Since taking over in October uh, 2007, Monique has emerged as a strong and passionate voice, it has to be said, for consumers in Brussels. Dirk Jacobs, who is Director General of Food Drink Europe since January of this year, representing the European food and drink industry. Before taking over the reins from my fellow Irish woman, Mella Fruin, Dirk served as Food Drink Europe's De Deputy Director General and headed the Department for Consumer Information, Nutrition and Health. Welcome, Dirk. Milka Sokolovic who is Director General of the European Public Health Alliance, EPHA, working to improve health and strengthen the voice of public health in Europe. Milka holds a degree in biology from the University of Belgrade and a PhD in medicine from the University of Amsterdam. Welcome, Milka. And last, but by no means least, and certainly no stranger to anybody in this room, we have Mr. Dr. Bernard Uhl, who is, of course, the Executive Director of the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, since June 2014. His mandate for a second term in office was extended in June 2019 for a further five years. A qualified vet by training, previously served as Managing Director of the Austrian Agency for Health and Food Safety, which represents Austria on EFSA's advisory board. A very warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, to one and all. And as I say, once I get the go-ahead from the technical team, we will then connect with a Miss Gutteland, who is, as I say, a Swedish Social Democrat and a member of the European Parliament since 2014. But ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Claire Berry, you're right beside me. On the left, I shall start with you. We have a countdown clock in front of us. We're going to be strict on time. So you've got a two minute impulse statement whenever you're ready. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Rose. Uh, oops, hang on, sorry. That, that would help, wouldn't it? So thank you very much and good afternoon. Um, I hear it's been going well so far. And I have to say, I loved Patrick's uh, intervention there. I think that's uh, for a YouTube video now in terms of what One Health is, uh, is all about. So we'll consider uh, that. Yep, yeah, absolutely. That's one for the books. For us um, in the Commission, it's certainly a core ingredient in tackling uh, the challenges that we have in the global food system. I think Patrick had a slide there. Uh, where food security had moved right up to the top. I think, you know, this time last year it might have been a bit further down, but now it's right up, uh, up the top. 
Uh, but of course, it's One Health, but it's not in the hands of one actor. Uh, there are many actors. And, and collaboration, I think, was a word that Patrick used uh, many times. Um, it's collaboration that we need across different disciplines, people talking to each other. Again, that takes us, I think, to the communication that was being discussed before. Um, and work between the different agencies. I think this conference, and congratulations, Bernard, to you and the other heads of agencies for bringing everybody uh, together, showing uh, how you are leading on that. Uh, and of course, I have to put in a word for our Joint Research Center, which is very much part of that uh, scientific uh, experience in sharing of advice. And I think as we go forward, we talk a lot about the resilience of our food systems, but we are also talking more and more and more about the sustainability of our food systems. Uh, so that story uh, will require even more collaboration, I would say, between uh, the agencies. Um, we've done a lot of work on antimicrobial resistance. Uh, you mentioned the changes now that are happening um, in DG Health, uh, DG Sante, to take account of the fact that we need to be more prominent and more specific and more operational, I would say, in terms of what we do uh, on One Health. On antimicrobial resistance, we have a very good story uh, to tell. I, 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 I read... Bernard, that you said within five years we'll be able to solve this problem of antimicrobial resistance. You were optimistic, uh, but we'd like to join you on that. Uh, we've also done a lot of work on zoonosis as well, obviously. Yeah? Uh, but there are other areas that we need to look at uh, where we are working. I would take animal welfare, biodiversity, soil health. Just been talking about that actually in the meeting I came uh, from before. The sustainable use uh, of pesticides. We're all hoping for good news from the Commission tomorrow on that front and rapid response to emergencies. So I think now we need to go beyond, I mean obviously this doesn't mean we shouldn't do antimicrobial resistance, we still have to focus on this silent pandemic, but we have to look at where One Health is uh, in other areas. So this conference is really a unique opportunity for us to get some, if I can say it, I'll get my pun in now, food for thought, uh, on how to go ahead with this. Huh? Uh, but thank you very much for bringing us all together to discuss that and, and to get some ideas going forward now and to collaborate. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, and thanks for sticking to the time. So Monique, we'll go straight Straight to you then, um, if you don't mind uh, representing the consumer organisation, please, your two-minute impulse statement whenever you're ready. Yes, uh, thank you very much and good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. So I'm, I'm working, I'm, I'm speaking here on behalf of the consumer uh, organisation and well, we are living, we have heard it already several times, I will not repeat it more than needed. Uh, we are living in complex, integrated uh, societies and markets. And in my organization, uh, we really have what we call the OOS culture, so out of silos. So my teams are requested, and I'm watching them closely, to always um, try to identify whether they have, you know, um, connections possible with other teams in, within, the, within the organization. And if there is a slighted signal, uh, they need to work together. And um, of course, it, it, it's certainly applicable to safety, to food, to the health teams, and to the sustainability teams. But I just would like to add two elements that might also be important for, for your discussion. And it has been a little bit mentioned by Patrick. It's you also need to uh, include a competition policy and trade policy because uh, One Health is not without competition policy and One Health is not without a well-designed trade policy that does not neutralize the effect of, of cooperation between the different agencies in, in Europe. So that's for us important. Well, my team certainly uh, fear when I come with my OOS idea and because, of course, it's sometimes you have the impression of you're losing a little bit your time, you're getting out of your comfort zone, you don't remember the acronyms of the other teams, you know, this type of thing. Uh, but then at the end, it's so inspiring, you come up with, uh, you come, uh, up with potential better outcomes for everybody. So it's really, it's an investment that is worth uh, doing it. And what I would like to say is that... Um, this, in, uh, this initiative, the One Health Initiative, is very welcome and it is much needed. And what I would like to say, I don't see, we don't see it enough at European level in other areas. I think uh, too many commission services um, or uh, let's say agencies, be it at European level or at national level, work in silos. And that can lead to regulatory capture because, um, for example, can I give the example of digital health? Uh, this is mainly um, managed by people who are working in the health sector without being digital uh, experts. So the geeks are not there to, uh, to respond to infect uh, the, the industry who is very, very uh, well equipped, of course, with experts on AI and what have you. And so last one I would like to say, uh, so welcome initiative, uh, good luck to also roll out now really uh, practical outcomes and can I wish you to contaminate other agencies uh, with that uh, approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monique, for that. And I've just been told by the technical team that we can actually join Jite um, Guteland now. Am I right in saying that? 
So, Jitte uh, Guteland, uh, can you hear us and see us? And we can hear you and see you. Welcome. I'll just introduce you for our um, participants in the audience. Jitte Guteland is a Swedish Social Democrat and a member of the European Parliament since 2014. From 2019 until 2020, she was the S&D coordinator in the Environment Com Committee, that's the EP's Environment Committee, where she is now a member. Jitte is joining us. Um, from, I would imagine, the European Parliament. So please, Jitte, when you're ready, you deliver your two-minute impulse statement, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to participate. And I'm sorry I'm not there in, in person. I would like to, uh, but we had to coordinate it like this. I'm very happy about that. I also like this um, uh, way of uh, highlighting the importance of the One Health approach. And I think it is a great initiative to also make sure that uh, we, we, we talk about how we can better cooperate uh, uh, between the different EU institutions. And I also believe that the European Parliament has a very strong and important role um, in this dialogue. Um, we definitely need to be more active um, in uh, putting political pressure in the implementing legislature um, as our citizens definitely expect us to do so. Uh, and um, I also think uh, uh, it is very clear that we need to work together since this is a matter for all of us on the EU internal market, but it also uh, goes across the agencies and uh, uh, we need uh, to have this broad uh, perspective on the food safety. Uh, for us in the S&D group uh, that I belong to, it has always been very important that we uh, highlight the importance of um, the preventive work always. Uh, we see that uh, when we look at the uh, different uh, diseases that are uh, difficult for our population in the European Union and in our member states, but it's also uh, when, when you look at uh, diseases that are um, growing uh, for, well, for the populations uh, like diabetes, cancer and so on, it is extremely important that we look at uh, more horizontal perspective of the preventive work and what is actually the root, uh, what's the cause of, uh, of uh, the, the problems that we see on the, for the public health. And uh, to tackle this large-scale challenge that it ac actually is, the One Health principle goes uh, in line with this. And therefore, I think this conference is very important and timely, and I'm very honored to participate and go into the different topics. And uh, often, uh, when I have been working in um, uh, the Environmental Committee in the European Parliament, I had the perspective of the chemicals, the endocrine disruptors, uh, but also, of also, of course, climate perspective that also goes hand in hand uh, many times with the challenge that we have. So uh, thank you so much. And I look forward to go into the different uh, uh, important topics. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much Jitte, for that intervention. And I'm sure we'll be returning to some of those points that you raised in a moment. Uh, Dirk, I turn to you, please. Thank you. You're ready. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Earl, for having us here uh, to this important and timely event. Uh, and I would like to congratulate EFSA on its 20th anniversary this year. I know they will celebrate it later in September. Um, and throughout the years, EFSA really has become a valued scientific advice provider and also a well-respected partner worldwide, not only here in Europe, but I think uh, you have set the international bar very high. I think with COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine right now, we're seeing how important food is and how important collaboration is and um, how essential it is to minimize disruption in food supply chains in order to uh, provide safe and uh, access to safe food. Um, and that provision of safe food is a responsibility that is carried by all partners in the food chain from farm to fork. It is important to underline here that food safety is and remains non-negotiable. Uh, in fact, it's a conditio sine qua non. Uh, without uh, safety, there is no food. 
and therefore there's also no food security without food safety. Uh, and I think we need to have to, have to remind us ourselves on that. It's thanks to our high standards that we have in the EU, but also the day and day out commitment of companies that we are having this level of food safety where consumers can be confident that the food that they buy is safe. And we like to keep it that way. It's everyone's business, but it is often taken for granted as well. So we have to uh, constantly remind citizens how important food safety is. And citizens are becoming increasingly demanding. Uh, not only they want food that is safe, uh, but also tasty, affordable, especially now, sustainably produced. Uh, so the, the asks are becoming more complex and more difficult to navigate. And our companies are conscious that they need to provide, provide that safe, innovative solution uh, to the market. And sometimes we don't have all the answers, particularly when you talk about the Green Deal, the farm to fork strategy, where we have a lot of challenges uh, that we've heard already before. So. Trust in science is critical uh, for consumer acceptance and in turn also for innovation in our industry. If we want to innovate and have an in, and a return on investment in innovation, we also need to have the consumer accept and we need to have the proper science that underlies that. And um, I think that's also one of the reasons why this One Health approach is so important <coughs> because, uh, because it allows us to bring dis different disciplines together, collaborate, collaborate together, uh, and also look at solutions for the future, and those solutions are urgently needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dirk. And uh, you mentioned EFSA's 20th birthday, and of course, Food Drink Europe celebrated its 40th birthday last week, so congratulations on that. Milka, please. The <laughs> oh, oh, very good. The same age as... <laughs> the same age as the Common Agricultural Policy then, Monique, is it? <laughs> Very good. Milka, please, whenever you're ready. Yes, thank you, Rose. Uh, and thank you, EFSA, for the opportunity to bring the civil society view to this uh, discussion table. For those of you who have not worked with EFA before, the European Public Health Alliance is a public health platform with just about 80 members working on local uh, national and European level, uh, bringing the voice of people to the public health debate. IFA has worked for many years uh, at the intersection between food and health, bringing always evidence-informed public health vision to the policy debate. I would like to stress in this uh, two minutes that I have that Europe's admirable food safety system uh, did not emerge from good intention alone. It was driven by strong and clear regulation. And today, as we face multiple converging crises, uh, we also urgently need a sustainable food system. And we believe in IFA that uh, a comprehensive transition towards it can also only be achieved through a strong and clear regulation. So just as, as the general food law uh, set in, in, in uh, sorry, the food law from 2002 uh, set the stage for Europe's food safety, the upcoming legislative frameworks for sustainable food systems will be instrumental for this transition. We do believe uh, that the One Health principle uh, should play a key role in guiding this change. Actually, just earlier today, IFA has published a position paper on why Europe needs a health-oriented food policy with One Health as a leading vision. And in the paper, we provide concrete proposals on how the farm-to-fork strategy and the upcoming sustainable food systems law can support all of us in our aspirations to eat healthily and sustainably. And then especially through the creation of enabling food environments for healthy and sustainable diets and through a nutrition sensitive approach to agriculture. And I warmly uh, welcome you to consider IFA recommendations. So to confirm, we firmly believe that taking a One Health lens will help us appreciate the interconnectedness between the health of people, planet and animals and it will help us realize the co-benefits that can be achieved while working towards the safe, healthy, sustainable food systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Milka. And as you said yourself, um, the AFA position paper is hot off the press, ladies and gentlemen. I have my copy here, so I uh, look forward to delving into that in a moment. Bernard, Mr. Dr. Earl. 
hmm. Executive Director of EFSA, please, whenever you're ready, your two-minute impulse statement, please. Yeah, thank you. You really did the doctor. We don't do that, you know. Huh? <laughs> no, thank you very much. I mean, I'm, I'm going back a bit because I, I did the, the, the opening statement uh, on, on, a, on a, which, which I think... Oh, uh, Siri also wants to talk to me. Sorry for that. In terms of science, I think we have to do homework as scientists uh, in innovation in science methodologies. I think we have to be much faster in innovation in our methodologies to, to uh, uh, see and um, confront, so to speak, the challenges ahead. And we have to do this together, but that's nothing new. I think we, it was stressed so often today. I will come back to that later. Then I think Besides science is the trust issue, it was mentioned so often also today, engagement, different ways of engagement, dialogues, reflection, how can, we, how can we anchor our scientific advice in a society that is ready to accept it? Even if the outcome is not liked because of value differences, that people say, okay, I don't like the outcome, but I trust the process, I trust that what you have done is okay. That, that would be on the trust. Third level is on Europe. We do not have enough resources as European agencies. We are small agencies compared to our US counterparts, but we have a rich ecosystem in Europe. How can we mobilize the ecosystem of Europe for the European project? That I think is something we have to work on together. And finally, a bit of a, a question from my side to myself, but also to you. Everybody talks about collaboration. Everybody says, yes, we have to collaborate more because it can only, done, can only be done with collaboration. So it's a no-brainer, but it's not done enough. So I ask myself, we're all talking about, but it's not done enough. What are the hindrances? What are the obstacles? Where do we need more energy in like, you know, overcoming the, the, the first mountain that is, is preventing us from, from cooperating more deeply? Maybe a question also for the social scientists. How can we entice collaboration? How can we reward collaboration in our organizations, between organizations? I think here something is fundamentally wrong. So let's rectify it. Thank you, Dr. Earl. But what's your answer to that question when you put it to yourself? This idea of collaboration, you say that there are hindrances, that there are sort of shortcomings in terms of, obviously it, it's, it's a, a panacea to collaborate, particularly when you're speaking about a One Health approach. What, in your instance, or in your experience working with EFSA, what are the shortcomings and what are the hindrances that you've experienced in your line of work that prevent that collaboration from happening in a, in a deeper, meaningful way? Well, I think we have to be honest that collaboration adds a layer of complexity. You lose autonomy. You have to give a little bit of, a, of your autonomy for the bigger purpose, which means it takes longer, it needs um, talking, it needs understanding, there can be cultural differences, language differences, uh, budgetary cycles are different, objectives of organizations are different, so it needs an investment in collaboration. And my view on collaboration is there are two different types of collaboration. Collaboration 1.0 is we have a problem, we want to solve it together, we collaborate, we solve it. Basta, thank you, we go. But my view on collaboration is different, is collaboration 2.0, which means we do not collaborate because we have a problem, we collaborate because we want to create opportunities for the future. And that's a completely different way of collaboration, creating opportunities and seizing these opportunities, not solving problems. But it's not done. Why is it not done? Rewarding systems in organizations are often on individuals, not on teams, not on collaboration. So we have to change the reward systems, the promotion systems. And maybe we have to make collaboration an objective of organizations, put it as an mm -hmm. objective and not sure. just as something that could help us as sort of from the sidelines. It must become an organizational objective. And something that Professor Wall um, mentioned earlier, I suppose, during COVID-19, that idea of collaboration just worked organically, right? Um, I'm just going to now return to the, the topic of the conversation. The theme of the conference this, for the next coming days is One Health, Environment and Society. So Monique, I'm gonna put it to you. What can we learn from this One Health approach? that's sort of underpinning all of our discussions for the next coming days and the principles when it comes to food and safety, uh, food and feed safety assessments in particular. Monique, if you'd like to take that. 
Just a few, maybe just a few thoughts, and also a reaction uh, to what you just said, Bernard. I think you need to provide the space for the people to have the time to cooperate, and resources are very scarce, and that means that there must be like a management decision to provide the space. Uh, that's very important. Now, sorry, uh, for that, uh, to that question, I, I mean, I think it's really, you need to look at the, at the big picture and um, go out of narrow mandates, narrow scope of interventions. For example, uh, like on a, a um, antibiotic uh, resistance or antimicrobial resistance, uh, if you just look at the, um, at the, at the end of the process, uh, the food is, in fact, there are no residues. So for the consumer, the food is safe, even if you use antibiotica in an inadequate way uh, in farmed animals. But, but you, you develop or you risk developing resistant bacteria. So if you look at the longer term uh, risks related to inappropriate, inappropriate use of um, antibiotics, uh, then you, you have a, a more preventive approach. It's not the residues at the end of the process that count. It's the fact that you create a risk uh, in, in, the, in the medium term, that the bacteria de uh, become resistant and that they therefore create a health problem in the long term. So that's the type of the big picture and the long term picture needs to be seen. Also, for example, um, the mandate, and that's uh, very often also the legislative, uh, uh, let's say, um, constraint, um, is sometimes too narrow. So the opinions of EFSA in the past, we have criticized them, for example, on uh, the peroxyacetic. Peroxy uh, uh, decontamination of um, of chicken uh, because it was uh, just looking at the at the last at the final chicken if I can say so while what is much better uh, be much better approach would be to try to prevent that the chicken gets ill at the end of uh, or contaminated at the, in the in the whole process because then you have a safer environment from point A to point Z and this is the type of thing that we that should be much more systematic so this preventive approach cooperation with um, with the other agencies. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to maybe return to you in a moment, Dr. Earl, just to respond to, I suppose, EFSA's mandate and uh, Monique's point that it might be kind of narrow in scope. But Jitze, I'm not going to forget Jitze, who is in the European Parliament. I might ask you just for your, your thoughts on that, Jitze, in terms of the One Health principle. You're coming from the S&D political group. Maybe you might like to maybe talk us through some examples of your experience in embracing the One Health principle in guiding the work that you do as an MEP. Yes, thank you. And I also uh, would like to say that what we heard uh, previously is uh, in the last intervention from our doctor was really uh, valuable and uh, I, I very much agree to that. Uh, but when it comes to the One Health approach, I would say it goes very much in hand with uh, how we as a political group and then also many of the discussions in the environmental committee who's responsible for public health has been addressing this, that we need to work uh, with the preventative uh, perspective all the time. And also, as an example, I think the COVID pandemic has really shown us how it goes hand in hand, uh, how uh, biodiversity, um, uh, pandemic prevention, food safety, uh, climate mitigation, how everything of that goes together hand in hand. And uh, if one link is, is going in a wrong direction, it will affect all of it. And uh, I've seen with the, uh, when it comes to the uh, animal welfare, uh, that if if we don't if we forget that uh, we need to have high standards on animal welfare, we will have more risk uh, of uh, diseases, and we will also uh, use uh, probably more antibiotics uh, in a preventive way that has been done in the European Union for a long time, and that's also very dangerous when it comes to the a a AMR, and. Um, I think uh, that we use uh, too much and uh, it's uh, antibiotics and that will uh, be extremely negative for our health. Uh, but for me, I think also we should not forget that uh, many of the problems we see today are also related to the chemical cocktail that we uh, kind of uh, swim in as human beings today. And that it's it's not super easy, and I have definitely faced that as my time as a member in the European Parliament to look, localize or locate uh, one uh, chemical and say this is it. It's not like that today. It's the cocktail effect that we have so many sources and so many different. Uh, 
environmental situation for us as human beings uh, being uh, exposed. And that is something where I think ECA has been very uh, active and I think that's good to provide the knowledge and help us. Uh, and I've been very grateful for that. But I think we need also more political focus on what we, how we can address this. And we need the EU Commission to give us proposals uh, how to uh, strengthen the, the legislation, not at least reach needs to be very much uh, in focus and we need to address the cocktail effects and, and different problems in that legislation that hinders us today. Okay, thank you, Jitte, for that. I'm going to get the public health perspective now. Milka, what do you say um, in, in terms of that One Health principle underpinning food and feed risk assessments? What, what's your, what's your input, input on that point? Yeah, my, my expectation is that the One Health approach will broaden our perspectives and, and push us out of the silos and help us understand the complex interrelations between food and health as part of the safety assessments but also throughout the EU impact assessment processes. Um, the food and food systems carry so many more implications to, to our health than we are often, well, able to even imagine individually. Um, we've mentioned them today, dietary quality, climate change, antimicrobial resistance, uh, air pollution, occupational risks, uh, ca hazardous chemicals were just mentioned to name just a few, and they're all part of this system. So we would be very keen to see um, expertise from different scientific areas being brought together to help us both capture and consider all relevant dimensions linking food systems and health. And this will be critical for sound uh, public interest policy making. Now, this requires uh, updated assessment methods. This requires, well, collaboration 0.2. Uh, but it first and foremost requires political will. And I hope that the discussion today and throughout the, the conference will help us in that direction. Thank you, Milka, thank you for that. So collaboration 2.2, that's something, or 2.0 rather, something that's going to emerge from this conference. Claire, I might turn to you now. Um, we announced at the top of the session this new directorate, which will uh, come into play on October 1st of this year, One Health. You said yourself AMR there is a central sort of plank within that, AMR and human nutrition. And uh, one of the speakers uh, mentioned this legislative uh, framework on sustainable food systems that is uh, due in 2023, am I right in saying that? Maybe you might give us a sort of a, a tour d'horizon very briefly uh, about uh, <laughs> sort of like this, the new idea of the directorate, first of all, on One Health, how that came about, and how this new legislative framework will embrace again this concept of One Health and how that will underpin this legislative, legislative um, journey as JT has just, just described. Okay, <clears throat> are you ready guys? I'm um, ready, pass your seatbelts, we're ready. <clears throat> I'll try and be brief again now. So, um, yes, uh, there is uh, going to be a reorganization, um, but we have already been working on AMR in the matrix way uh, across uh, DG Sante for some time. Um, I was at a conference the other day, actually, where somebody proposed uh, that we should be DG One Health, and there was immediately a round of applause at that point. Huh? So I think this is another step towards uh, really recognizing the importance of One Health uh, throughout um, and, and integrating some parts of it. I mean, in that new directorate that you're talking about, uh, we will also have international units which will deal with not just uh, food issues, as been the case in the past, but also with health, because we need a much more integrated approach in terms of, uh, of what we do internationally. Yeah? So I, I see this as a small uh, but in, important step uh, in terms of getting everyone to move together. And if I could just make a couple of comments on collaboration, because I think it's an important point. I mean, Bernard, you said it takes more time. It does. The other challenge as well, of course, is that people feel that they lose a bit of ownership over what's going on, uh, because it becomes a product which is a product of the team. Um, so within the commission, I know, Monique, we still need to make more progress. We have, I think, we are making progress in terms of working outside uh, of silos, but we've also been looking at how to reward colleagues when they work on cross-cutting projects, uh, and how you can, when, when it comes to promotion time, that that gets recognized, and it's not just 
uh, you know, your director or your head of unit uh, looking after what you've done for the specific uh, unit or directorate, but looking more broadly. Um, and I think I, I liked your idea of working together to create opportunities, Bernard, but I think it's a little bit um, pie in the sky, if I may say so. Um, pie in the sky, it's a little bit, um, you know, how, how easily can we touch that? Because the problem is that we know that it works best when you put people on a problem. You give the team a problem um, and they work and they all bring their abilities to work on that and then they come with a result. But creating opportunities is a whole different thing, though, because, I mean, they know what the problem is, they know how to apply themselves, but, uh, I mean, I'm willing to work with you, Bernard, to see if we can do that, to create opportunities. Huh? Um, but uh, on, on this point of collaboration, and it brings me to now the framework on sustainable food systems, so thank you very much, Mocha, for raising that. So I didn't need to raise it, you, you said it. Um, there we're working with four DGs. This is very much a collaborative process uh, with DG Environment, with DG Mare, with DG Agri, and, and with DG Santa. Yeah? So the idea here is that we will put in place a framework with principles and objectives for the whole of the food system, that it will be based on the three pillars of sustainability, which are very much, it's very much one health at the end of the day if you uh, analyze it in terms of, uh, uh, of what it means. Um, we're working on specific projects in parallel to um, mainstream sustainability in them. Uh, for example, on the seeds framework now, we're coming with incentives to put sustainability in there. On the new genomic techniques, we think that this very much uh, needs to be linked uh, to, um, for example, seeds that will uh, become drought resistant and they will have particular traits that are linked uh, to sustainability. So the two things are going in parallel, a framework. It's going to take time to fill in the framework. That's why it's called a framework. Huh? It's not going to be overnight a revolution, uh, but it will sort of say what the box looks like, what the principles, what the objectives are, and then we'll have to see how we fill it in over the coming years. Okay, well, we'll be following that very closely, Claire. Thanks for that. Dirk, I might turn to you now from the food and drink industry perspective. So we've talked about the main themes there that are emerging, collaboration, the holistic approach to, to looking at a risk assessment. What's your take from the food and industry viewpoint? Yeah, I'm uh, very um, grateful that Bernard actually raised the point of collaboration because I think if there's one thing to note today is that we work much better in collaboration if there's a crisis and that's very unfortunate because in fact we should be working also in the good times and much better in the way that we we're doing right now so be it the COVID pandemic uh, where we had to keep supply chains open but also where we were confronted with questions about food safety is the food actually safe does it migrate uh, is there any migration problem coming from uh, COVID etc um, I think that shows where we were very strong and, and, and much more forward-looking um, now we seem to be going from crisis to crisis. Uh, the whole discussion, I think, should be about are we prepared and are we resilient for, like, to be there in 20, 30, 40, 50 years' time. And that's, I think, the kind of common objective that we'll, we will have for the collaboration 2.0. All of us that think that we need to make our food systems more sustainable in the long run, um, that where food safety has, and, and the One Health approach has, uh, of course, an, a central role to play. I think we now need to come all together and start preparing that. But you need to have the mindset of a future-looking, a, a, a proactive attitude instead of the reactive attitude that we so often see and how, which is difficult to, to beat. I see it also in my organization, and I think uh, everyone can, can relate to that. Now, to, to One Health, um, I think it's very clear, and we've heard it this morning um, or the, earlier this afternoon, that the safety of food uh, and feed also is affected by the health of animals, uh, plants, and the environment within which it is produced. So it's a no-brainer um, to, to see how those linkages are, are happening. Uh, climate change is associated with altering the geographical occurrence, and that also leads to a prevalence of new food safety hazards. But there's also the social dimension and new consumer trends that might lead to an increase in food safety risks. So I think it's, it, it shows that this holistic approach uh, makes sense. And if the current challenges are already very complex, the future challenges will be even more so. Um, and the, the goal is not to drown in that complexity, but to, but to manage it. Um, and, and managing complexity is something that the One Health approach can, can bring together. Um, so we really believe that this is uh, something that can contribute to evidence-based priority setting. I think uh, if you look at the Green Deal objectives, uh, the, the sustainability challenge that we have ahead of us, 
there's a lot of prioritization to be made. What should we do? What, where are the win-wins? Um, and I think also um, a, a, a transdisciplinary approach to food safety assessments can help out there. It's also about, of course, uh, identifying the gaps that are there in science and, and evidence base, and also the trade-offs. Uh, if you look at things like salt reduction in, in food products uh, for reformulation purposes, that should not uh, uh, compromise on hygiene or on shelf life. Uh, so uh, mapping those trade-offs, uh, uh, for instance, packaging, circularity, we can reduce the, the, the packaging, but if that has a, a negative impact on food safety, on hygiene, on, on, uh, on, on creating unintentional food waste, uh, then there's something wrong. So I think also there, uh, scientific assessment can actually be very helpful there. Okay, thank um, you for that, Dirk. I'm just going to pass to, over to Bernard again because it was a point raised by Monique and her point was part of the challenge with integrating a One Health approach into risk assessment has to do with EFSA's narrow mandate. What do you say to that, Bernard? And is that something that you've experienced? Is that something that maybe is up for discussion? It was just in response to something that uh, Monique said in her impulse statement a moment ago. Yeah, I would say EFSA's mandate in, in total is very broad. It's from farm to fork. So, you know, we start with plant health and animal welfare and animal health and biological hazards, chemical hazards, and so on and so forth. So we have a very broad mandate. Uh, you know, as, as an, uh, a responsible for an organization would say, can I be broad enough? So commission, can you give us new mandates? We are happy to take it with new resources, obviously. And I think what Monique was referring to that sometimes individual questions that are asked to EFSA could be seen from different parts of the civil society in a different view. Is it too narrow? Is it too broad? But there we rely on our colleagues from the European Commission. We do this together. There are also legal obligations and we are in the luxury position. We also can do self-tasks. So if we think we should do something that nobody asks us, but we think it should be asked, then we can do self-tasks, but we have to be careful with that also in terms of resources. We don't overdo that. So all together, I think we are very fine with our mandate situation. Thanks sure. also to the good collaboration with DG Santé, the Parliament, and, and um, also the member states. Sure, thank you for that, Bernard. Uh, Monique, you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, I wanted to react to what uh, Dirk said about the trade-offs, and I think it's a very important point that if you have a more, a more global approach, you can identify the trade-offs, and it's really important to, to uh, find a solution that has the less trade-offs, and I brought this nice gift uh, just as an, as an example, um, not that I think it's not safe, I'm not sure, I have not tested it, but we have seen a lot of... Uh, um, food packaging materials that have been made out of recycled materials. So you say it's about sustainability, you, you recycle the material, but that has that contain a lot of uh, unsafe toxic uh, chemicals. So uh, that's a trade-off that we would not like to, to, to live with and would not like, and it have, I mean, our members have tested and it's really, it's in pasta, it's in rice, uh, it's in breakfast cereals, the paper packaging or the, the board packaging uh, is, has really uh, contained in the testing unacceptable levels of toxic chemicals. So it's important to also then uh, create, let's say, the, the recycling, um, process in a way that is that remains sure, again safe. this holistic approach that, yeah. that we've been discussing jt i'm going to return to you now just um another question and and it was something again raised by professor wall a moment ago this evolving situation that we find ourselves in whether it's related to climate change animal and health diseases and diseases and environmental degradation how can we ensure that the the feed and the food safety assessments that they remain agile and fit for purpose Yeah, it's a very important uh, question, but I don't think it's rocket science here. I really think it's possible to have an agenda where we go systematically for uh, a food safety chain that will from uh, uh, in all its part uh, be uh, sustainable. I think that's the, the way for the European Union to lead uh, the future. And, there are so many things that's actually linked to each other in also the positive way that we know that uh, when we speak about this circular economy that was addressed uh, now, uh, we can in the same time also work in parallel, of course, and that's it's, it goes together. It is a link to have uh, also poison-free 
future where we uh, phase out uh, the hazardous uh, uh, chemicals. And I think we need to work very systematically with the endocrine disruptors. Uh, and I, I really believe that the Commission needs to put much more focus on that uh, relevant uh, part of, of it, because these chemicals are literally everywhere and affects the food uh, that, uh, that we eat. We had seminars in the European Parliament showing that um, as also been mentioned, uh, the food emballage con it contains uh, chemicals that are very dangerous for us, especially for the young population, especially for the kids and, and youngsters who are eating uh, maybe fast food, bringing home uh, with uh, um, materials that is connected to the food and that will in the long run harm the endocrine um, or the hormone system and that affects the fertility it affects uh, the risks of getting serious diseases in the future and we already see it happening uh, and therefore i think this goes very much hand in hand to work for uh, less uh, emissions in the in the food production uh, less chemicals, have a more heterogenic perspective when it comes to the farms, have a, um, both via the farm to fork strategy, but also cap work with incentives for, for farmers, but also for the food industry to, to shift. But we have not had that focus. That's the problem. The political discussion has not. It is like this part of, of the Green Deal is, yeah, there are good, good elements, good targets for 2030, yes. But we need also to really do the work, go into the legislation with the same kind of focus that we do now for the industry when it comes to climate. Uh, like the Fit for 55 package is huge, super concrete, important to reduce the emissions. We need also in the farming sector do the same, both with the chemicals and uh, for also the, the climate. And we need to be more concrete in the work and let some of the lobbying outside the house, uh, if I should say so, because I, I think that's also very harmful. Uh, for the Commission and also for the Parliament. Okay, thank you, Jutta. As you, you've touched on a number of touch points there, I think we'd have to extend this conference by a few days. But as you say, these are all topical issues. And what you're looking for here is joined up thinking, I think. The Green Deal we have, the farm to fork strategy we have, the common agricultural policy, and, and all the piece of legislation that knit between those large policy areas. But if I may, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to now turn to our participants online. Who, uh, and here in the auditorium, of course, who have sent in some commentary. So I'm first going to go to a comment by Nancy Podvin. I would like to ask that, uh, the panel, um, in, they, the panel indicates if they think that the EU consumer will need to change faster their consumption pattern, and if yes, how this can be induced. How can this be encouraged? I'll turn to you first, Monique. About consumers, I would say changing our patterns, our what we eat, our behavior patterns, and how can this be encouraged, incentivized? So I'm going to go to Dirk afterwards, but we'll come from the consumer perspective first to Monique, and perhaps Milk afterwards from the public health perspective. So how can this be encouraged, incentivized, mm -hmm. etc.? So the short answer is yes, we will need to change our consumer patterns and very quickly. And uh, let's say the, the bad news is, uh, as consumers, we need not only to change our food consumption patterns, but also the way we travel, the way we heat or not our homes, the way we, uh, we, uh, we move uh, uh, in, in urban uh, areas, the, the way we buy or not products. So we have a lot of challenges. And uh, as a consumer representative, we are saying we really need to do it. We really need to move because we only have a very uh, narrow window of opportunity because uh, otherwise uh, there will be no future generations. What we say there, also the, the good news is you can do it. Um, and uh, what we are saying in, in three, ad, uh, three uh, adjectives, yes, uh, you need to make the sustainable option the most affordable one, the most easy one, and the most fun one. So with those three, 
uh, elements. I mean, it's easy to say, uh, but you can do it. And for example, in, in the food area, what we are saying is people don't need to become all vegetarians from one day to the other, because that would be a punishment. Punishment is not fun, so you need to make it fun. But you can all become flexitarians or just reduce your meat consumption to uh, two or three days a week. And maybe you end up being a vegetarian at the end of the, uh, of the process anyway. But this is the type of thing that needs to be done. And how can you do that? For example, I would already at EU level uh, tell DG Agri, stop uh, promoting and subsidizing the, the, the marketing of meat. You, we need to go to more plant-based diets. Stop promoting meat production and meat consumption. That's a very clear signal. Um, and support uh, plant-based diets, for example, that's then at national level, you could say reduction of VAT uh, for, plant, uh, for, for fruits and vegetables, for example. So these are the types of incentives that people uh, should uh, receive in the food area in order to, um, uh, to, to move towards more sustainable consumption patterns. Of course, industry can help a lot by, promote, by for example, m making more affordable or giving more prominent uh, healthy options. And retail has a very important uh, role to play in uh, having a marketing, of a, let's say, a policy that promotes uh, food and vegetables rather than meat. Okay, that's quite, quite, again, touch points. I'm not sure if there's any representatives from farm organizations in um, the audience. Uh, so yes, interesting um, perspective there, Monique. I might go to Dirk now from the food drink industry in response to that. How can, I suppose, this, this idea of changing and encouraging a change in consumer patterns, how can that come about? Well, I think the, the evidence is quite clear that consumers do need to change. Um, I think there's, there's no discussion about that. Um, but what you then see in practice happening is still sort of a, the, the challenge that everyone is, uh, is dealing with. And uh, as, as food and drink companies, we're trying to follow consumer trends and consumer directions as well. And looking at, for instance, uh, Eurobarometer studies, um, also having their caveats, obviously, it seems that, uh, and, and the last one in 2020, that Europeans still prioritize taste, food safety, and cost over sustainability concerns, uh, even though we are seeing more and more uh, in the marketplace that environmental, uh, ethical, social uh, health considerations are becoming more and more uh, important. Um, but especially now in these times of crisis where affordability of food is so important, uh, this, this will take a completely new dimension, uh, and the trick is to bring all of that together. I would disagree with Monique that uh, there should not be any EU funds going to meat production. Uh, on the contrary, I think we should stimulate sustainable meat production uh, by using also some of these EU incentives. Um, and I think the incentives work both on the consumption side but also on the production side uh, where we can, uh, all, where all actors should be encouraged to move towards more sustainable um, agricultural practices, uh, business practices, and so forth. So I think uh, that's my answer to that question. Thanks, Dirk. And that's, of course, a debate that's ongoing in the European Commission at the moment in DG Agri with the overhaul of the promotion policy. So we'll wait and see on that, whether DG Agri is going to shift uh, its, its policy. Milka, I might turn to you then in response to that question, uh, changing consumer patterns. You're coming from the public health perspective here. Yes, and from the public health perspective, I would take the responsibility of the consumers. I would put the responsibility on the policymakers and on the industry for creating the environments that Monique was describing, such that our choices, ours, you know, we are all consumers, our choices are always made easy, fun. What was the third world word? Affordable. Affordable, absolutely, first. Because, because as Dirk says, cost is usually the first choice, the determinant of, of, of our choice. And interestingly, health comes on the fourth place and sustainability is probably below health as well. So there is also, uh, there is also a role of the rest of the community uh, or the rest of the uh, institutions of the society, including media, including NGOs, because, because also we need to communicate better about the choices that, that we want to make. And we all need to turn into influencers. And then when we speak about communication, we go back to the, to the question of trust that Bernard was, was raising, trust in science, trust in institutions, trust in commercial sector, trust in media. So I wouldn't say it's a vicious circle. I would say it's a circle that we could switch to be um, 
kind of a positive feedback loop if we want so. What I find really encouraging from this discussion today and others that happen around us is that we do find ourselves in such a perfect storm that we do align, we do all appreciate the urgency of the situation, we do all realize that we need to act and we need to act now. So I'm a little bit more um, positive and optimistic about that, that comment on, on collaboration that, uh, that Claire made before. I think uh, we may be creating the opportunities or working efficiently to, or working together towards opportunities because we are pushed to do so. But back to the original question, yes, we can make a difference to the, to the uh, consumer's behavior pattern. I would only add uh, also the social sciences to this equation because we also need to learn more about people's behavior. Okay, thanks for that, Milka. Dr. Earl, I'll go to you with another question. I might just change tack slightly. We've talked a lot now for, over the duration of the past hour about a more integrated, a more cross-sectoral and collaborative health assessment. But how would they work in practice and in your view, would they be easy or difficult to implement? Well, I think it, it will not be easy to implement them because we come back to, to governance, alignment, timelines, objectives, collaboration. But I think from my perspective, when we talk about sustainability and all the problems and solutions that were also mentioned here, in different countries in the EU, there will be different political decisions to be made because of GDP, because of structure, because of culture and habits. But all these policy decisions will need a common state-of-the-art evidence base. And the evidence base cannot only be food safety. Food safety is the starting point, as you said, Dirk. If it's not safe, it's not food. That's the conditio sine qua non. But then we talk about food safety, we talk, we talk about risks, about benefits, we talk about impacts. We talk about if we do something in the food system, like using herbicides, who has the benefit, who has the risk, what does it mean for farmer incomes, what does it mean for food prices. So what I am arguing for is to bring the knowledge of the scientific agencies of the union together in these pieces that I tried to outline, so that more holistic, more impactful, future-oriented decisions can be made by policymakers. And this is, for me, the one health stepping stone towards sustainability assessments. Not only looking at safety, but looking at safety plus. And this will not be delivered by EFSA, of course, but we will be part of something much bigger. You could call it a virtual One Health Agency that together delivers scientific advice that policymakers can decide wisely about the future. Claire, sounds, ever, sounds easy, no? Sounds easy, no, absolutely. Claire, maybe you might respond to that, uh, this, this idea of a virtual circle and, and more involvement. And think again about the, the role of the GRC here as well, right? And, and its, exactly, yes. And its role within that virtuous circle, as, as Banad discussed. So to take the sustainable framework again that Milka introduced and that you asked me to, to mention, uh, the JRC is very much involved in the work that we're doing on that. And, and I see that as very positive development and they're helping us to actually frame the way that we ask the questions. So I think we are getting better at including that scientific advice upstream. Um, I think there's also the relevance of the scientific advice that's important though, um, because we need to look at each particular policy context and see what's needed. Um, Bernard, you and I have been discussing with the colleagues a lot over the last few weeks and we need to continue that uh, conversation about um, what does it mean uh, that the scientific advice is, is operational and fits what we need from policy? And part of that, of course, is that there have to be clear conclusions that we can use as a basis for, uh, for what we do going forward. Um, but I think now we very much need to learn from that as we start to look more and more at sustainability and what that means um, and how we can have the One Health scientific advice towards sustainability. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Claire. I'm conscious of time, would we believe that the hour has ran out? So I'm actually gonna wrap things up there, right on schedule. I'd like to thank the panelists for this very lively and interesting debate. Claire Berry, Jitte Goetheland for joining us online. Thank you very much for connecting with us. Monika Goyens, Dirk Jacobs, Dr. Milka Sokolovic, and Dr. Bernard Orl. Now I'd invite uh, everyone to give my panelists a very warm, warm uh, round of applause. 
and I would invite you to return to your seats. You can now return to your seats. I, before I hand over the reins to our chairwoman, Barbara, I would like to thank everyone for taking part in this lively debate, which I think you would agree provides a lot of food for thought to steal Claire's uh, pun from earlier on in the session, about the challenges and the opportunities ahead in embracing this One Health approach to risk assessment in the food and feed chain. I would think, I would say that collaboration is key going forward, and there's a number of key legislative um, proposals that are coming on stream that will inform and that will, I, I, as I said before, embrace this concept to, in, in its fullest form. I would like so, to also take this opportunity to thank Dr. Earl and his team for putting this show together. A lot of work went into this, as you can imagine. A special word to Barbara, Jan, Chinsia, and my former colleague, Mr. Ed Bray, who before moving to Parma back in 2017, used to work as deputy editor of the reputable Agrifax. So a very warm word of thanks as well to all of you and to the technical team who made today's event run so smoothly. Many thanks to you all. And I look forward to seeing you all again on Friday morning when I will be moderating the plenary session, the closing plenary session. So until then, ladies and gentlemen, take care and thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Barbara. Well, it's the end of the first uh, day, and uh, I think uh, we can say that we've enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the discussion. I think uh, it's not often that we see panel discussions uh, being conducted so openly. And uh, uh, really, this uh, spirit of collaboration, this need and this willingness uh, to collaborate uh, came across quite strongly. So I'd like to thank Rose, um, and uh, it will be a pleasure to, to have her back on Friday to thank the panelists uh, and to thank uh, the speakers uh, for the afternoon. But I'd also like to thank uh, the audience uh, online uh, and here for engaging, for being here to uh, discuss things, uh, to take them over uh, into the next uh, days. It's only the beginning of the conference, so I don't think uh, it's for me to give you some takeaway messages, uh, because uh, between tomorrow and Friday, you will have the opportunity to choose between 17 breakout sessions, uh, which, as Bernard was saying, are grouped uh, in four uh, thematic tracks. Uh, and uh, the full program uh, will restart tomorrow morning at 9, and uh, in different rooms uh, across the venue and online, uh, in different online spaces. But uh, if uh, you are physically in Brussels uh, and you fancy a bit of a mellower start, uh, there is a space uh, which I would recommend uh, that you go to, which is a panoramic uh, room uh, on the fourth floor of uh, this building, where you have a fantastic view of Brussels uh, and where you can start the day with a yoga class tomorrow, with a mindful meditation uh, the next day. And we will have breaks uh, uh, for two hours uh, over lunch, uh, and uh, we have created space uh, for some uh, parallel uh, sessions, some science cafes, uh, some discussions uh, focused uh, on One Health, uh, which uh, will be managed uh, by member states, uh, EFSA staff uh, and agencies, uh, staff, the MV agencies uh, with whom we are co-organizing this event. And there will also be the opportunity to be in the panoramic room over the break uh, for some stretching. So we want you to feel welcome and uh, to find a comfortable place uh, where to be with others uh, and network. And uh, the last thing that I'm left with uh, uh, to do today is really to welcome you, if you're physically in Brussels, uh, to the cocktail reception that we will, will take place uh, just uh, in the foyer outside uh, the auditorium. So thank you very much uh, and uh, see you tomorrow.